As a premier community in Hampton Roads, James City County strives to maintain a high quality of life for all citizens through sound fiscal management and legislative actions. In an ongoing effort to increase transparency, your Board of Supervisors holds public meetings to garner citizen input before making important decisions. Here's tonight's meeting agenda. Stay tuned, the Board of Supervisors meeting will begin shortly. I'm gonna go ask Teresa. evening <laughs> nothing like putting you on the spot okay we just come on down we just start with a moment oh yeah thank you golly hold on wait a minute get myself collected call this meeting of the James City County Board of Supervisors regular meeting to order good evening everyone if you will do the roll please yes ma'am Mr. McGlennon Mr. McGlennon represents the Roberts district Mr. Eisenhower Here. Represents the uh, is vice chair and represents the Jamestown district. Miss Sadler Here. represents the Stonehouse district. Mr. Hippel Here. represents the Powhatan district. Miss Larson Here. is chair of the board and represents the Berkeley district. With that, uh, we if Miss Henry will let, lead us in our pledge. We start with a moment of silence and then um, just start with the pledge. To the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Yes, we will get you a certificate and a pen. <laughs> just have to give us just a just a, a meeting. So um, I do want to start this evening, if I could, with uh, some information regarding the recent uh, sales tax uh, proposal that is at the General Assembly. Uh, the tax that Senator Norman introduced at the General Assembly has passed and currently sits on the governor's desk. It is critical that the citizens of James City County understand that this has been a state-driven process and that the Board of Supervisors does not get a vote on the proposed tax increase. The state legislator, legislator gives counties a limited number of possible ways to generate revenue. The state code itself sets out the very specific taxing authorities. We have a limit on food, beverage, taxes, tourism, room nights, taxes, gas or transportation taxes, cigarette taxes, and most importantly, sales tax. The Board of Supervisors must get state approval to change these taxes. 
And historically, we've been denied the ability to impose taxes, especially in terms of the cigarette tax. Every year, our legislative agenda focuses on our goal of having the legislators support the locality by limiting the amount of money needed from our citizens to pay for various unfunded mandates and taxes. I did attend a meeting on 11-1-17 with the county administrator, as well as the 15 plus members of the HTC, which is the Historic Triangle Collaborative. The discussion centered on potential sources of revenue to enhance and revitalize tourism in our area. No vote was taken. Senator Normant did float ideas to increase tourism funding, similar to what has been done in other lo localities where funding is much greater. Again, this meeting was for information purposes only. There was no action taken. The state has a similar process to localities in terms of a public hearing process, but it takes place entirely in Richmond. The sales tax bill was submitted in January with all of the other legislation for this term. They had committee meetings and hearings and multiple public votes on the issue. While the board members are free to make comments like any other citizen, Virginia remains a Dillon rule state. Legislators in Richmond dictate our authority on many issues. Cities and counties are treated differently in terms of taxing authority. The city of Williamsburg is able to levy an admissions tax and can raise their food tax. James City County cannot. This new sales tax is contingent on Williamsburg rescinding their tourism taxes. Once the city rescinds their taxes, James City County loses the ability to levy the tax at all. As a formality, we can strike the language from our code, but it is strictly and merely housekeeping at that point. While the city of Williamsburg can cause the new sales tax to expire, James City County does not have that same authority. Our board prides itself on our public input process. Our budgeting calendar includes multiple public hearing opportunities as well as multiple community meetings and work sessions. We try to give our citizens many chances to understand our budgeting priorities and strategic goals as well as the impact of our various revenue sources. We will continue the commitment of open and transparent decision-making processes this year as we begin our budget deliberations. I am certain that at the end of the meeting during board directives that the individual board members may decide to make comments on this issue, but we wanted to make sure that we had an explanation as to how taxing does and does not work for James City County. So thank you, thank you all. With that, we will move to public comment. And we have a new form. Jeff Anthony. Madam Chair, board members, I'm Jeff Anthony, uh, 336 Millstream Way, live in Settlers Mill. Uh, just wanted to take a few minutes this evening to address a topic which is the explosive growth of pickleball and the gap that exists between the sport, the players, and the availability of regulation courts. Now, right up front, let me be clear. This may sound trivial, particularly in light of the other topics you're gonna talk about or hear from tonight. What I can assure you though is the topic intersects community wellness, sports tourism, as well as other travel and economic development topics. Uh, and before I even go any further, I wanna make sure that I publicly acknowledge and thank uh, John Carnifax, Parks and Rec team, world-class stewards of our resources, recreational resources. Whether you're five or 75, if you like to play outside, Parks and Rec has it covered. <laughs> so we, they are fabulous. Um, so, and I'm also speaking not just as a resident, but as the uh, representative locally for the National Association, the US uh, a Pickleball Association, and Pickleberg.com, I know, fascinating, uh, that represents and really is the voice of pickleball players throughout the community. Doesn't represent everyone, but it is a public forum. There's no fee whatsoever for that service. Um, you got a read ahead package, I believe. Some of you have had a chance 
and which is wonderful. Pickleball is just a paddle sport. It's been around since the mid-60s, and it is growing like crazy. Uh, big picture, in the U.S., there's about 5,800 known places to play, registered places to play. Um, that's adding about 94 new uh, locations every month. In terms of the number of courts, there are uh, 21,154 courts, adding about 384 a month. That's in the U.S. The first uh, event that they held in 2009 had 400 players, competitive players. In 2017, the national championship, which was on uh, CBS Sports Network, had, uh, let's see, 1,300 players, 5,000 matches over five days. So you can start to see the, the sports tourism economic development. As far as the participant report from Sports and Fitness Industry Association, there's 2.8 million players in the U.S., 12% increase over last year. I would tell you that our growth in our area is tracking well ahead of that. The key point in all of that is that 75% of the folks playing in the core demographic uh, of active players, 75% of them are 55 and older. That has, in my view, a direct impact and relationship in terms of community wellness here because this sport has an impact on cardio, balance, coordination, uh, weight management, the work. James City County specifically, we've grown from late 2009 of under 49 players who were considered active at that time to over 200 and, well, it's 215 as of today. That's registered on pickleburg.com. That does not have anything to do with the individual communities and who's playing in them. Uh, it's played every single day of the week and into the evenings at Veterans Park. It's played in warm and cold weather. Last snow event, actually last year's snow event, we had players who actually went out and shoveled snow <laughs> on the courts <laughs> to play. You do not see many other racket sports or outdoor sports where they're doing that. They're a different breed of cat, the players in our, your community. Uh, they don't hang out individually or in small groups. They hang out in a large group. They're social. They're thoughtful of everyone else who's playing, so when tennis players come on to use uh, dual-use courts, they get to come on the courts. We move off the courts. Veterans Park, we share that space. Uh, they have a carry-in, carry-out philosophy. They don't leave any trash anywhere they play, and they pick up everybody else's trash. So it's, uh, it's, it's pretty different, uh, self-policing. Uh, they volunteer their time, and there are hundreds of them volunteering their time conducting introductory clinics, uh, Colonial Heritage, Patriots Colony, Williamsburg Landing, Settlements, Ford, Ford's Colony, Kings Mill, Landfall, Settlers Mill, all event clinics done, hence the growth. They even volunteer their time with the kids' multi-sports camp at uh, James City County's um, Parks and Rec. Is that my five? Goodness. It is. Are we singing? <laughs> or are we singing me off? Anyway, well, the bottom line is, there's a gap, a huge gap, and here's where it is. While we've grown much faster in the county than even the national, we have two dedicated courts, dedicated regulations. Some are painted over tennis courts for dual use, but the reality is right now we have two, and we need at least four to six to play. It's an easy solution. Uh, there are spaces, Veterans Park, I won't get into Parks and Rec's business, but uh, you could take easily two and convert them to four more spaces. Um, thank you. If you have yep. further comment, you can yep. send all of those to us. Perfect. So. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Dorsey Smith. Okay. Good evening, Mrs. Larson and other members of the board. My name is Dorsey Smith, and I live at 105 Lake Drive in Lakewood off of Jamestown Road. I'm here to share a concern that I and most of my neighbors in Lakewood have about the ever-increasing danger of Jamestown Road in the vicinity of the entrance to Lakewood and Nicoland Road. There is a short stretch of Jamestown from Lake Powell to the entrance of Settlers Mill, which creates a significant blind spot for folks trying to exit Lakewood and also from Neckland. From Lakewood, 
the challenge is trying to judge traffic from a curved road in both directions. It is especially dangerous to try to cross traffic in order to turn left on the Jamestown Road. One has to quickly look left and right repeatedly to make sure that there is no traffic coming and you're, then you, you try to exit from Lakewood, especially crossing traffic, to uh, head north on, on Route 31. And even though you tried to be cautious, people all of a sudden are behind you because they're coming around a blind curve at excessive speed. There have been two recent accidents, one in late December and one in mid-January, and I'm aware of two others in the year prior to that. And I know there's no reason to believe that there won't be other accidents, and my fear is that one of them will end up being tragic. Again, because you're exiting that road from a dead stop. You're exiting Lakewood trying to merge or cross that traffic, and people routinely speed through there. And that's the problem. It's the excessive speed going through that section, that small section of Jamestown Road. And I'm very thankful uh, James City County Police are often positioned in that little pump station off of, off of uh, Jamestown Road because they know that people excessively speed through there. And I've... I have witnessed many people getting issued tickets, and if that's what it takes, that's a good thing. And I'm appreciative of that, but that's a good indication that it's quite, it's known that people speed through there often. So since it's clear that we cannot remove the curvature in the road, and it's clear that the volume of traffic is going to do nothing but continue to increase on Jamestown Road, especially with all the new development off of Neckland, that the only thing that we can do is try to control the speed going through that small section of road. And, and that's what I really want to address is what can, we, what can be done to lessen the speed that goes through that small blind curve. So to that end, I began sharing my concerns with members of VDOT last July and also with Mrs. Larson, who was kind enough to share my concerns with appropriate others who could interact with that concern. And my suggestion was a simple one. Reposition the conversion from 35 to 45 miles per hour sign, which is currently located heading south on 31. It's located currently 30 yards past the entrance to Neckerland. And I think it should be moved beyond the curve, maybe past the entrance to Settler's Mill, so people don't convert from going 35 to 45 until they hit Settler's Mill and you take the curve totally out of the equation. And the same thing with coming in the opposite direction, where the conversion from 45 to 35 heading north on 31 happens right at the entrance to Neckerland, and almost immediately at the entrance to Neckerland. So needless to say, people come around that curve, uh, and they don't l legally have to decelerate until they hit that sign. And many people do not decelerate until they're past that sign. And then r I'll remind you, too, that people who routinely travel on Jamestown Road heading toward the ferry know that it converts to 45 right past the entrance to Lakewood. And needless to say, many of those people start going 45 or higher well before that sign. So in essence, then you have people going well past 45 miles an hour in both directions on, on a blind curve. And another problem with that is that the volume of traffic is increasing, but I also routinely bicycle on that road, and I see a lot of people bicycling on that road. And the people, the excessive speed on a blind curve with people bicycling and people trying to enter and exit in both Neckland and Lakewood, it's, it's just becoming a very dangerous thing. So my hope is, is that uh, one thing that can be done is just reposition, this is a, a small thing, reposition the speed limit signs to pass Settler's Mill. It's of minimal cost to VDOT to do that. It's minimal inconvenience to drivers but the impact on, on public safety could be huge. So I'm asking you for your support to do what you can do to help make that small stretch of road safer for everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Lawrence Luck. Good evening, I'm Lawrence Luck. I live at uh, 126 Ware Road in James City County. Good evening, Ms. Larson and members of the board. Uh, Mr. Smith is a neighbor of mine. I also live in Lakewood, and the reason I'm here tonight is to, uh, to second his suggestion that the speed limit be reduced on Jamestown Road from about um, where Ironbound Road intersects it to where Neckerland Road is. Um, I go out of that neighborhood once or twice a day, 
and it is very hazardous because of the sight distance both to the left towards town and to the right towards the ferry. Uh, looking northward, uh, the road bends in a left-hand curve, but there is a steep bank on the left-hand side that really obscures vision as you look south coming out of, uh, out of Lakewood. Um, when the foliage is in full growth, the sight distance looking uh, towards town uh, across what used to be Lake Powell uh, also is very, very hard to see. And so getting in and out of that neighborhood requires uh, very quick acceleration to, to do it. Uh, with people driving from the ferry into town, commuters um, slowing down from approximately ironbound road uh, by 10 miles an hour would be a minimal delay for them. Um, and so uh, I won't rehash everything that Mr. Smith has said, but I do think that uh, something needs to be done to reduce the speed in that area, whether it's a reduction of the speed limit, uh, adding flashing lights of the way that are on um, uh, Strawberry Plains Road between John Tyler and Jamestown Road that flashes to let you know that you're exceeding the speed limit. Something to alert people that they are going faster than they should be on that. There have been a number of accidents and they can be avoided. Thank you. Thank you. Joseph Swanenborg. Good evening, board members. Joseph Swanenberg, 3026 The Point Drive. I'd like to follow up on uh, your comments, uh, Chairman Larson, as, as far as the uh, tax increase and that, uh, you know, at this point right now it is, as I believe you said, it is sitting on the governor's desk waiting for him either to sign it or veto it. Um, from what I hear, um, most people are not in favor of this. And I have the phone number for the governor's office and I would encourage people to call and, and, and leave a message there, talk to the, the, the governor's assistants and, and let them know what, uh, th that they do not want that tax if that is in fact the case. Uh, the, the number for the governor's office is 804-786-2211. That's 804-786-2211. And uh, uh, ex express their uh, displeasure with uh, this bill. Both of our House of Delegate members for this area, Delegate Pogi and Delegate Mogan, uh, Mullen, both opposed this. And I find that very hard to accept this tax when both of our House of Delegate representatives did vote against this and it was voted on, it was approved by people who don't live here and don't represent the people that live here. Um, so that's the first item. Second item is, uh, there's a number of issues involved around this. One is the, the overbearing idea is how we manage our development. Um, what tools we use, how we use them, what we do with them. Uh, we're gonna have to start thinking out of the box on what we do and how we do it. Uh, the PSA line hasn't worked and, and has actually kind of imploded upon itself. Uh, we have other issues going on, but one of the problems I have, and right now we have a, 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 a case that hasn't made it out of the Planning Commission on apartments in Norge. Um, not sure where I stand on this. Uh, uh, off the top, I'm probably not particularly in favor of it, but I'm, I'm not quite sure. But we use what's called a cost of services provided number uh, value. And the number is in the $730,000 range that each residential unit must assess for $730 some thousand dollars plus or minus in order to pay for cost of services provided by the county. Everything that the county does, schools, police, fire, EMS, everything else, an umbrella number. Uh, I implore upon you, I implore upon staff to please stop. That is a fabricated number. If that was the case, we would have to triple, uh, double, more than double the current real estate taxes. Our average real estate assessment is just over $300,000. So how can you say that new construction must assess for $730-some thousand dollars. It's not 
physically or physically possible. Now, if I'm opposing these apartments, this actually makes those apartments look a little better. So I know I'm contradicting myself here. I just don't like the idea that we have a number out there that is so incredibly fabricated, it's not remotely close to the truth. I don't remember the exact numbers on what percentage of real estate taxes pays for in the budget. I can't remember if it's 40% uh, uh, or somewhere in that range. But if we have an average assessment of around $300,000, that means it takes $300,000 to pay for cost of services provided because we take in money from commercial properties and we take in money in other ways that actually is a higher portion of the budget. And I find it very difficult to take the county seriously and realistically when we fabricate a number in such a way and it's unfair to the public and it's unfair to the truth. That number needs to be given out. It, it, it can't be anything other than the average assessment. It simply can't. If we have a budget that is balanced, we're not paying for our budget from cash reserves or anything else, that's the number. So I thank you for your time and your consideration. With that, that is the end of the public comment. That brings us the, to the VDOT quarterly update. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair, other distinguished members of the board. <coughs> and when I'm you, I'm sorry, when you're finished with your, could you maybe bring, because I know that you are very aware of the situation that has been brought up tonight in public comment. Sure. So if you could talk a little bit about what's been done, and then I, we can follow up with that. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. Thank you. Um, this quarter, um, VDOT completed 411 of 491 maintenance work orders. Um, 80 outstanding, 84% completion rate. Um, the biggest outstanding are drainage and roadway, potholes, um, water sitting in ditches, drainage concerns. Um, also, I, I always put this little plug in, the residency has a direct line now, 757-253-5138. Um, Feel free to call it. Uh, we have a work order system. We put maintenance work orders in. We prioritize, we try to take care of highest priority um, projects you know, as they come. A few highlights of the accomplishments are we repaired over 1,200 potholes and road repairs with over five, uh, 50 tons of asphalt this quarter. Uh, we cleaned over 200 pipes and culverts, cleaned out ditches, cleared sight distance on Route 60 Richmond Road. Uh, Countywide mowing, county uh, litter pickup, our primaries were, were done in February, secondary routes start March 26th. Um, and the county, second county primary route mowing is scheduled for April um, and then again in May. Uh, some current projects, we have an emergency repair on Route 30 um, on Rochambeau Drive. Um, and also we have some, emer not emergency repairs, but some slope repairs on Route 60 on the other side of Anderson's Corner. Um, all of those are slope repairs. And all the rain we've had, we've had some... Uh, some pretty significant slope failures, um, some of the higher incline cross, crossovers. I-64 segment one was completed on time, December 1, 2017. I-64 widening segment two, uh, that's currently under construction. Alan Myers is our contractor for that. It's a design build project. The completion date of May 24th, 2019. The I-64 widening, widening uh, segment three, which runs from 199 to 199, um, <clears throat> that has also been awarded to Shirley um, Construction that is designed built, and that has a completion date of uh, June 26, 2021. So uh, if you've ridden 64, the first section is completed. I have three lanes in each direction, and hopefully we'll run that all the way up at least to the other side of 199. So. has been going fairly well. Um, we also have a new project uh, that's under construction. It's Brookwood Drive at Route 199. Um, that's to convert the existing right turn lane um, on 199 East to a left through lane and add a new right turn lane on Brookwood Drive onto 199 East. Uh, construction, construction has started, per se. 
um, and it'll be completed July of 2018. Um, the contract does have an early incentive um, to be completed by June 19th, so you know, hopefully a year early. The Long Hill Road widening project is a smart scale project. It uh, is currently uh, in the right-of-way acquisition um, phase. Um, construction advertised will be late 2018. Uh, construction work will start in spring of 2019 and scheduled completion is 2021. That runs from 199 to the Old Town Road, uh, 7-Eleven area, uh, and it will add a through lane in each direction. Um, and we have the uh, Old Town Road, Long Hill Road turn lane improvements, which is the rev share project from 2017. It'll also be done in the same time frame. Um, and that will improve the signalized intersection Old Town Road at Long Hill Road, add a turn lane with added capacity um, uh, by the bank. So um, PE starts March 2017. Project will be advertised and coordinated with Long Hill Widening Project. So um, some pedestrian stuff. It does extend the existing right turn lane and uh, adjacent sidewalk. Uh, Skiffs Creek Connector Project, uh, that is also a smart scale, um, the 2018 smart scale project. It constructs a uh, two-lane um, road connecting Route 60 and Route 143. Uh, the project is in PE using pre-scoping. Uh, a location study public meeting was held on February 15, 2018. Uh, right away is projected to start in November of 2022 with construction in March of 2025 with a completion in January of 2028. Um, we have the News Road and Centerville Road project. Um, this increased safety, safety and capacity at the intersection of Centerville and News Road by constructing a right turn lane on News Road, a right and left turn lane on Centerville Road, and adding a new traffic signal on Centerville Road at the intersection. Uh, the right-of-way has begun. Construction will start in November of 2019 with completion of 2021. Um, Jamestown Ferry Boat, uh, we, Powhatan, is uh, scheduled to uh, arrive this summer. Um, so it is a 70-capacity boat, just like the Pocahontas, um, and it's, uh, it's, it's going along well. We get updates, pictures from time to time. Um, Bridge replacement, Route 601 over Duskins Creek, uh, Diaskins Creek. Um, this has replaced the bridge on, uh, I call it the Hicks Island Bridge, Route 601, with a uh, with a existing size bridge. It's currently in the PE, with right away to start in November of 2018. Construction will start in 2020. Um, also in your six six year improvement plan, we have the Croker Road four lane widening project from the library to Route 60. That uh, increases capacity from Route 60 to uh, Route 1647 Point Woods Road. Um, it's currently in the PE with right of way to start in July of 2018. And construction will start July 2020 with the completion of October 2022. Uh, we have the Pocahontas Trail reconstruction and we are have current efforts on this project uh, is a corridor assessment and community engagement to identify feasible project phases that can be funded and constructed. Uh, this F is scheduled for completion in early summer 2018 and it will be used for a smart scale application to try to get, get the project funded. Uh, there is, I will put this there, there is one month more public meeting scheduled in April and the final study results should be, uh, should be in late May. Um, we did have some emergency response this quarter. Uh, it's been three snowstorms since uh, since I last did a uh, quarterly update. Uh, we had the nine or ten inch snow early January. We had another three inch snow late January, and then we worked last night. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, all of those went fairly well. Um, last night was a little bit of a surprise based on the, the local forecast, but. Um, Luckily enough, the temperature stayed well high enough that it uh, went away pretty quick. Uh, we completed some traffic studies this quarter. Uh, Route 30 at Fieldstone Parkway. We we're installing double yellow center lines in the median crossover and yield signs. Uh, Route 614 at Lightfoot Marketplace. We install post-mounted no-turn on red signs. 
um, and um, right turns on Centerville Road, Route 606, Riverview Road, speed measurement existing. Um, we did the speed study and the existing 85th percentile was within five miles per hour of the existing speed limit, so there'd be no change there. Um, and we also, you brought this up, the Route 31 um, Jamestown Road speed study, safety study that we performed um, from that study, uh, one, one of the quick items were to uh, increase the um, speed limit, the 35 mile an hour speed limit sign, um, which for 48 by 60, and to also increase the uh, notice placard um, to a 48 inch placard. The Miss Utility tickets have been put in for those, and they should be up within the next 10 days. Some um, under review, uh, we have uh, Brandon Woods review for placement of stop signs at Apri Circle. Uh, we also have uh, review at Opportunity Way for additional speed limit signs. Um, and this pretty much concludes the quarterly transportation report I have for the board. Thank you. Um, I will start. What What is the issue? Is it possible to move the speed? where the citizens are requesting. Uh, I mean, I, I travel that every day, and uh, they, they're right. They're, they're, the police are there a lot. I'm always going 35 in case anybody. Um, <laughs> but uh, I try to anyway. Um, but uh, it, in, in the extra, you've got the, the two way you have to come out across the street from their name. It is a very, I, I want to say wonky, I don't think that's really a word, but it is it is a very awkward situation there. And then when you are, when you've got that curve there, is it, what all is involved or what, what would it take to make the decision to move it to where they're requesting? Well, um, I don't, I don't, the decision really isn't whether the speed limit needs to be moved or not, is how to make sure that the traffic Talking about the geometrics, um, there is, I think, looking south, there is a, uh, a sight distance issue. Um, to, to ultimately control that would to be realign um, Nekalan and, and um, you know, realign that and put a signal there um, because there is a sight, sight distance issue. The thing about moving the speed limit, um, we've done a speed study, safety study, and we've done a, um, a speed study separate studies together, um, and, and found that the 85th percentile was in the lower 40s um, in that section. So there was thought process by our traffic engineers is that just by moving the speed limit down the road, up the road, isn't going to slow down the traffic. Um, there has been, you know, they talked about increasing the sign. Um, also increasing the size of the notice. There was also um, a suggestion in, the, uh, in our recommendations about adding uh, the blinking lights. Um, however, that would be something, and I discussed that with uh, Brian before he left, and, and Jason and I have had this conversation as well, um, that you know, if the county would like to go forward with that, but it, we can't use solar, so it's a yearly utility. Um, the, Crash volumes, the crashes, um, you know, we looked at the three-year crash history. It's, it's not, doesn't show that it's any greater than any other intersection like it is. Um, so there'd be some decision made on that. Um, what exactly, you know, do you want to fund and, and if that's what we want to do. Um, so there's, there's a couple options there that we could do. I mean, they certainly could realign the intersection, make it a lot safer make it just as safe as any, you know, any other intersection, um, putting some signals up there so you don't have to worry about the sight distance any longer. But the speed limit sign being relocated, um, our traffic engineers do not feel that it would be beneficial. Yeah, that's, oh, go ahead, Mr. Moore. <coughs> I understand you don't think it would be beneficial, <coughs> but it wouldn't hurt. Uh, he actually believes that um, by putting it down the road, um, he thinks drivers will ultimately, at the first speed reduction they get to, slow down. But as time passes, they get faster and faster. So his concern is that 
they would even be a little faster by the time they got to the intersection. And they are currently? And they are currently. Currently they're in the low 40s, the 85th percentile. I mean, you have outliers, but that is the 85th percentile. And I'd be glad to sit down and with our traffic engineers and discuss this, you know, in more detail. Um, but we did the study. Uh, it wasn't recommended to, to move the existing um, just down the road. But the blinking light. That, that's on the table. That's, that's something that we will have to yeah. work with the locality. We'll find out the expense of that and see if yeah. we can move forward. Yeah, I, I provided uh, Brian the estimate. I think okay. he provided it to you all as well. Okay. I, I think I saw an email in that. I did. Yeah. There's a couple of things combined together, reset. I think, yeah. in that email. We, can, we, we will get that to you. Okay. Okay. One thing that I would maybe ask you to consider, um, we've, uh, I've seen it used in my neighborhood in Quartz Colony quite a bit because we have a tremendous speeding problem, uh, and that they have put out the little trailer, you know, which is the mobile trailer with the signs. They've also got one, I guess, that's a um, post-mounted, uh, looks like it may be solar, uh, run uh, on some of the major areas where they where they are uh, having uh, speeding difficulty, and uh, our board of directors in there has basically done speed studies and found that those two things really have brought the speed down considerably. Would that be uh, something that uh, would be considered? You know, it's one of those signs that says you know speed limit such such and your speed is, and, and when it gets about five miles above, it starts flashing, and when it's ten miles above, it big red slow down. Uh, yeah, you know, it, it's, like it's, a, it's an option, and I think Mr. Luck, was it? Uh, Mr. Luck actually mentioned that when he was doing yep. his uh, public yeah. comment. Yeah. He was referring to the one there on Strawberry Plains yeah. in the city of Williamsburg. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That really gives you sort of, it's a radar attached. Uh, the the, I think we've the bad thing is the solar is not going to work mm -hmm. there yeah. because yeah, just like the, the blinking lights, we're gonna have to, you're going to have to run a utility to yeah. it. Uh, yeah. So there's going to be a monthly cost um, for that to run. Um, but it's called traffic calming. That's what yeah. it is. Yeah. Now yeah. I forget what you had quoted on a on a different place. I think the yeah. use of that and it it wasn't an. But I, I, it's hard to have these kind of conversations when you're talking about money because nobody's safe. You know, you don't want to put a price tag on safety, so to speak. But then again, you got to find where the the, well, the money's going to come from. I think you had sent. I, I don't have the study with me, but that's the thing I want to kind of. Based on the safety study, there wasn't, you know, it, it met within the criteria of accidents. So we're not talking about a location, uh, and there has been a couple every year, but there's a couple at most intersections of that area within the county, within the country. Um, so to say that it's a, a safety, safety issue, you know, where it, the number of crash rates are high and the number of injuries and stuff of that nature, it did not, based on the study, it did not show that. Okay. Maybe if we could get a follow-up on the flashing lights and then if you could just send another um, another information piece about what those do cost, current cost, sure. of, the, the, of the traffic calming. Um, that one on Strawberry Plains is extremely effective. Yes. Um, you know, especially now, 25. Most of the time, though, you only find those in what I consider residential area. The city has a little different rules than VDOT has. Um, you don't normally find those on primary routes like Jamestown Road. You right. find those more in residential areas. Okay. Um, so based on our traffic calming, it doesn't qualify, but I will talk to our traffic engineer and see if that would be an option based on the study that we did, based on right. the traffic volume. And I do think the, an important thing, um, and I know there's probably other VDOT, sorry, I'll wrap this That's up, fine. this part of it, but um, there is an, th that road shoulders the extra responsibility in the, especially in the summer months of tourism as people travel to the Jamestown area coming off the ferry from Surrey, you know, it's it, it takes on a little bit more traffic. So it is a it's a unique situation in itself. So thank you. Welcome. Shall I go ahead? Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, so first, let me start uh, by expressing my appreciation for the good work that VDOT's doing in these public meetings on both Skiffs Creek and the Pocahontas Trail uh, um, improvements. 
the meetings seem to me to be um, uh, well subscribed. A lot of people uh, came out to both of those meetings that you talked about, and we got some very good feedback. I was especially pleased to see on the Skiffs Creek project the possibility of significantly reducing the footprint, uh, which would uh, not only have an impact visually and in terms of environmental effect, but also reduce the cost significantly. So um, thanks again for all the uh, good work on, on those projects. Glad to see them moving forward. Very welcome. I also just wanted to mention, I uh, um, was uh, pleased to see the, the work on potholes. I would ask that uh, you maybe have somebody take a look at uh, the area between Brookwood Drive and uh, Rolling Woods Drive, uh, um, because there are some pretty big ones along on the way Lake there. And on Lake Powell. On Lake Powell, on right. Lake Powell. Okay. right. Uh, we, we currently have, we're doing, other than the storm last night, um, yeah. kind of threw us off a little bit, but this week we were scheduled to do night work. We have quite a few on our primary system, 199, 60, 143. Um, so we're going to try to secure those during night work to less Great. to impede traffic. I know this is gonna, this has uh, got to be a terrible time of year to try to deal with all of these, is. especially is, after the winter. It, we've it happens having. every winter, so yeah. it's almost like a cyclical thing. You yeah. Know? Um, yeah, we do pothole blitz, or, <laughs> or you know, try to go and get what we can, and then yeah. when the winter and the plants open. The hardest time is between when we start getting potholes yeah. and the asphalt plants aren't open. So only thing we have is uh, patching and uh, what we call temporary patch material. So uh, you know that that causes a little bit of challenge. But once the plants open, uh, we we have materials readily available. And that number you gave us would that be the right place for citizens to call in with reports of potholes or can and if we and you can use that phone number 24 hours a day. Uh -huh. Even though we don't staff the <laughs> phone 24 hours a day, if we're not there, it automatically goes to our 1-800 customer service number. Great. And, and I'll just, just repeat that. Numbers. It was so 757-253-5138. Correct. Right? Great. Okay. And the other thing I, I, I uh, did want to ask about was the uh, Brookwood uh, Drive uh, expansion. Um, I, first of all, I, I'm very pleased that uh, the schedule seems quite aggressive and, and uh, the fact that it could be potentially completed by the latter part of June, I think, I think is just uh, great. Um, however, it is a pretty busy time of year um, with uh, Laurel Lane Elementary School still in session and with uh, uh, the amount of traffic that is uh, on Brookwood these days heading out to 199. Is, uh, do you have any special plans for, for addressing the um, heavy volumes of school bus traffic? Uh, of, and they we do. Have the, the limitations of operations, actually all the work done out on 199 mm -hmm. is going to be done at night. Oh, great. <laughs> except for two days' work. Mm -hmm. um, and they'll have a detour. They have to shut down a turn lane to do some nose work. So um, 199 limitations of operations for night work. Uh, Brookwood will be done during the day, but there will be still through traffic. Um, uh -huh through the process, through the through the project. So um, there's really no detour type route for um, yeah. Lake Powell. Uh, so it, they'll maintain traffic through, through the, throughout the process. Okay, okay. Thank, you very, thank you very much. Uh, I think that's it for me. Yeah, I'll get to it. Um, <coughs> Mr. Carroll, uh, I have um, got you, Scott, you sent me the uh, memorandum that uh, we did on the pedestrian crosswalk review for Ironbound Road at Oldfield Road. Um, and I had seen some email traffic from uh, Mr. Hill before he left um, that they had uh, sort of given a, a go ahead on that. And then we hadn't heard anything for a while. And I was I contacted uh, Mr. Porter to follow up on it. Um, can you give us a, an idea of where we are with that process? Or is, is, who, where's the ball? Is it in our okay. court or your court? <laughs> we're we're kind of still, Jason and I have been working together. Okay. We're still trying to figure out some funding, who's going to do what. Okay. Um, the study was completed, mm -hmm. uh, let's say, October of 2017. Um, there's some few things before we go in and put signs and, and, and uh, stripe it or, or mm -hmm. put the uh, markings in. Uh, there's need to be some connectivity. Um, county right away on one side, the other side I think is within our right away. Um, ADA compliance, um, some connection, um, and then the county would be responsible for the um, flashing beacons. Okay. Um, 
Is this another one of those where it would have to be connected to utilities, or is it possible Actually, to solar? we can use solar okay. um, in this area. We did the report, and I think it, I think, I believe it said solar. Anybody read it? I think it said it's solar. Um, so that's a good thing, because that's a one-time charge instead of a okay. monthly utility. Um, so um, that's our option there. So we're still working. Jason and I are working together and trying to figure out exactly are we going to try to do this with contract work um, or whether we can try to do some of it with state force work or what the county can do. And I believe this was done in conjunction with some uh, additional work at the intersection of Ironbound and was, News um, to, to deal with the, the turn lane. Is that, is that still ongoing as well? It is, and <coughs> we're doing that. Okay. Um, the, the study involved <coughs> not only looking at the crossing at, uh, it's not a mid-block crossing, but the crossing at Old Beale but also to look at the existing crossing okay. at News and Ironbound. Um, and we're going to put up some signage there. Um, our, our concern is vehicles turning right, noticing pedestrians waiting to cross. There is a push pad there. Um, also, currently the arrows, red arrow, um, according to the MUTCD, doesn't allow for right turn on red. Uh, so we are... We've looked at that intersection. Right turns on red are fine. Um, so we're changing the red arrows to a red ball, which does allow for right turns on red, which everybody turns right on red there. So, um, so that, that also was part of the study. So If you could uh, keep us uh, through, Jason, if you could keep me posted, because um, there's uh, a great deal of con uh, interest in this in the, in the, uh, um, the meadows uh, in the community, and, and I'd like to be able to keep in touch with them and let them know our progress on this, because this has been a concern ever since the, the lane expansion was completed. So, okay. thank Sounds you. Sounds good. Thank you. Mr. Bain, um, I received a call from a citizen regarding, is this the one? Regarding uh, Newman Road. I know there was a tragic accident there uh, recently. I don't think it was a road issue, but um, she was um, concerned about the how narrow the road is, um, that it poses dangerous driving conditions because of the narrowness. I don't know if a study had been done about potentially widening that road or uh, what our options could be. Um, if that's something maybe you could look into and get with Jason. Sure, be glad to. You'll be busy. Uh, I do know Newman Road is, and we have some work coming up on Newman Road, some tree removal. Um, and I think this summer we have some <laughs> shoulder, uh -huh. there's some low shoulder areas on there. But the pavement is paved. It's not surface treatment anymore, so it has been paved. So I think they're around 20 foot, at least 20 foot wide. Um, maybe less, maybe maybe so there's areas that aren't that, but. Yeah, there's some areas uh, There's some areas that do that. But that, that is also due to the right of way. There's variable width right of way on mm -hmm. Newman Road. A lot of it's only 30 foot. We don't even have room, and it's high banks. We don't even have room for what I consider appropriate shoulders and ditches based in the current footprint. But there's certainly, we can look at that, and, and the board can look at decisions on, you know, we've got the secondary six-year plan, rev share projects. It certainly may be something we can do in the future. Okay, thank you. Also, there's some signage down up around exit 227. I know right across yep. from the McDonald's in the median there. I can't get close enough to it to see what it is, but it looks like a do not enter sign. A okay. double, it's a red sign. I think it's a double one that's laying down. And then as you're leaving um, Stonehouse development, right in the median there, there's um, there's some signage that's down. I don't know if it's... We, we have been very down. busy since the yes, wind storm I can imagine. Um, with signage, but... Um, yeah. And snow, too. Uh, yeah. Snow, there's still some plenty left over from our snow plows. But I, pr I appreciate that. Um, and you mentioned a litter was going to be something you're going to be doing in March? Yes. Yes. Well, in the intersection there close to the McDonald's at 227 across from Michelle's Point, something went crazy there in that medium because it's, I'd get out and do it myself, but I don't have boots high enough to get out and do that. So um, it's it's a mess right there. Is it something that's causing a safety issue? I'll have them go ahead and pick it up now, but if it can wait Other to Other than our looking at it trying to figure out what in the world <laughs> it is, <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that. Well, I'll uh, have a look at it. If it's something that can wait to our March pickup, yeah. we'll do it then. If not, That'd be I'll great. send the state force. And then I'm still and always asking for a stoplight in front of Stonehouse Elementary. Just saying. Thank you. Oh, okay. 
Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank Appreciate you. all the information. Look forward to, to getting back. Uh, that brings us to Parks and Recreation Sponsorship Recognition, and um, I hope, uh, yes, hi. <laughs> I, it's, um, I'm, I'm looking here, Julie Northcutt Wilson, how are you? I'm good. Thank you. I'm sorry, I could not find my place on this piece of paper. <laughs> I'm going from technology to paper, so. Thank you, Madam Chair, board members. Parks and Recreation would like to recognize the many local businesses and organizations who support our department through sponsorships and advertising. Last year, we received more than $30,000 in cash and in-kind contributions. These funds allow us to offer amenities to the public, such as a free youth football camp, a phone charging station at the James City County Recreation Center, and complimentary biodegradable dog litter bags in county parks. To showcase what our community can accomplish when we work together, I'd like to share a three minute video highlighting our sponsors and advertisers contributions in 2017. There we go. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. Once again, thank you so much to our sponsors and advertisers. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to respond.
thank you so much. I hope that when people see these, um, when they go to these sponsors, I hope they mention, you know, if they participate in these programs, how much we appreciate them advertising uh, with several of these programs. I saw several repeats mm -hmm. of businesses, which is, is really uh, a testament. And also to, the, to you all, thank you for working so hard to try to get these sponsorships. That's important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we ha will have introduction of new police officers. Uh, Chief Reinheimer will be introducing them. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you, Madam Chair, board members, Mr. Porter, Mr. Kinsman, county staff, and citizens. Thank you all for giving me this opportunity. Last year, we started doing this uh, just as an opportunity for us to introduce new police officers to you all, the board, county staff, and also our citizens. So you can see uh, the new police officers, because I mentioned it last time, they often start on, on midnight shift or evenings, and you don't see a whole lot of them. Uh, but know that they're out there. They're out there 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, protecting you and serving our community. So I wanted to have this opportunity to introduce them. So if I could have Officer Michael Bowen please come down. Officer Bowen began his law enforcement career at James City County in September of 2017 and recently graduated from the police academy. He grew up in Pocosin, Virginia, where he graduated from Pocosin High School in 2009. <laughs> and in 2013, he received his bachelor's degree from Old Dominion University with a major in criminal justice and minor in sociology. Officer Bowen joined the Virginia Army National Guard shortly after graduating from college and became a human resource specialist for a field artillery unit based out of Norfolk, where he still serves today. Officer Bowen has been married to his wife, Danielle, for about three years, who are both enthusiastic Redskins and Nationals fans. Uh, they plan to move to James City County in the very near future and look forward to buying their first home together. Thank you. Officer Kurt Dykstra was born and raised in James City County and graduated from Jamestown High School in 2007. He attended Old Dominion University where he earned a bachelor's degree in criminal justice in 2011 and enjoyed four years of collegiate rugby and was recognized by the school as MPP his senior year. Kurt began his career in law enforcement as a police officer in Portsmouth, Virginia from 2011 to 2015 where he was also a member of the SWAT team. In 2015, he continued his career as a police officer in Austin, Texas until the beginning of 2018 when he finally came home <laughs> and is looking forward to serving the department for many years to come. In his time off, Kurt enjoys being outdoors, spending time with family, and training for powerlifting and strongman competition. Thank you. <laughs> Officer Logan Heishman. Officer Logan Heishman was born and raised in Bridgewater, Virginia. After high school, Officer Heisman enlisted in the United States Marine Corps and has served in numerous assignments to include places such as Washington, D.C., DC North, Carolina, North Carolina, and in Eastern Europe as a part of the Black Sea Rotational Force. He provided security to embassies of local countries during a time of civil unrest, as well as providing training to foreign national military leaders in the tactics of combined small arms. Officer Heishman ended his active duty contract in 2014 and completed his associate's degree and also received a two-year certi certificate of completion in the studies of criminal justice from Masson Hutton Technical Center. Officer Heishman began his law enforcement career, career with the Augusta County Sheriff's Office at the beginning of 2016 before coming to James City County in 2018. He's also a certified CrossFit trainer and volunteers to train numerous athletes in a local community as a coach at JCC CrossFit in Norwich. He continues to serve in the Marine Corps Reserve out of Richmond, where he serves as an ar artillery operations chief and platoon sergeant. In his free time, Officer Heishman enjoys focusing on his personal fitness, as well as outdoor activities to include hunting, fishing, and kayaking. Officer Michael Renner was born and raised in the Toledo, Ohio area. He attended Perrysburg High School where he was a member of the football and baseball teams. After graduating high school, he attended the University of Toledo. 
While in college, he enlisted in the United States Marine Corps where he served as an infantryman and a member of a specialized anti-terrorism security unit. Officer Renner served five years in the Marine Corps and was deployed with his unit multiple times before ending his contract in 2016. At that time, he was stationed in Norfolk, Virginia. He would then go on to graduate from the Newport News Police Academy and serve as a police officer in Newport News for a little over a year. He was recently married in September of 2017 to his wife, who was a first grade teacher in Hampton. After moving to James City County in May of 2017, he decided he wanted to serve the citizens of James City County and be an active member of the community he resides. Officer Renner was hired by us in December of 2017. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all for this opportunity. Uh, I just want you to see the fine folks that we do hire here in James City County. Uh, and we live in a tremendous community where police officers are, are really cared, cared about and our community truly, truly respects these officers. And these officers do this job for the right reason and, and we see great results. So thank you all very much. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chief. Um, I would just add as well that I think that uh, you are to be commended because um, while I believe your officers are respected, I believe that is because they also give respect in return, and I think that that pays dividends. So we're very excited to have you here, especially those of you that have come back home, and I thought you looked very familiar. My son graduated in 09 from Jamestown, so, um, but welcome and, and thank you so much. Uh, there, it, that is a huge calling and um, we're so appreciative that you're here to protect us. Thank you all. Uh, with that, we are going to go into the consent calendar, but before we do that, I do want to um, say hello and recognize, and if I miss somebody, I'm very sorry. Uh, Nate Green, the Commonwealth Attorney, is here. Uh, Richard Bradshaw, the Commissioner of the Revenue, uh, Commissioner of Revenue, and Jack Haldeman, who is uh, the uh, Planning Commission, I believe, the representative this evening. So I just want to thank you all for being here this evening, and several members of the James City County staff. Thank you all as well. I'm sure you're here strictly on a voluntarily basis. <laughs> Um, with that, that brings us to our consent calendar, which is one minute's adoption to grant award Commonwealth Attorney V-STOP grant program fund 59425 three, resolution of appreciation for Mr. Carlisle, L. Carlisle Ford, four, resolution of appreciation Dr. Jack Edwards. Is there anything anyone wishes to pull? Move the adoption of the consent calendar, Madam Chairman. Okay. okay. I was going to ask to pull the minutes because I, I would like to vote separately on them. I was not here for the one from last year. Sure. And I think it would be most appropriate for me to abstain from that one. So if you could vote those two separately. Okay. Yes. And while we're pulling, um, we're not going to pull the resolutions. We will be recognize We will be pulling those out and doing that more formally. Um, so I'll I guess. the resolution uh, minus the uh, minutes of uh, July uh, 2017. Thank you. Mr. Porter. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Mr. Hibble. Aye. Mr. McLennan. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. And with that, we will do the minutes adoption. And we, during that time, our clerk, uh, for these minutes that we're adopting, our clerk was out. And we somehow that we just have a little housekeeping snafu there. So um, we'll now vote for the minutes adoption. Mr. Hibble. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Abstain. Mr. McLennan. Aye. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. Motion carried. Okay, and Ms. Sadler, if you would like to go um, the do the resolution of appreciation for Mr. L. Carlisle Ford, and she has something that she will be reading. Good afternoon, sir. If you'd like to come up, or if you want to sit, whatever you would like to do. This is a resolution of appreciation for Mr. L. Carlisle Ford. Whereas Mr. L. Carlisle Ford was charged with establishing the Agricultural and Forestal District AFD program in James City County, and whereas Mr. Ford organized the creation of 12 
agricultural and forestal districts to preserve more than 17,676 acres of land in 1986. And whereas Mr. Ford has served the citizens of James City County as a member of its AFD advisory committee from July 1986 to January 2018, and whereas Mr. Ford demonstrated a deep and lasting concern for the development, management, and administration of AFDs throughout James City County, and whereas Mr. Ford, by his actions, has helped to preserve agricultural and forestal lands for future generations of James City County residents, whereas Mr. Ford has had a long and distinguished career serving the citizens of James City County, first as a business license inspector starting on January 7th, 1974, and was then promoted to deputy business license inspector on January 1st, 1980, and then became commissioner of the revenue from January 1st, 1984, until his retirement on December 31st, 1999, now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of James City County, Virginia, does hereby extend its appreciation to Mr. L. Carlisle Ford and expresses its gratitude to Mr. Ford for 44 years of dedicated service to the citizens of James City County. Adopted by our board on uh, James City County, Virginia, this 13th day of March, 2018. Thank you so much for your support. I uh, just want to tell the citizens of James City County how grateful I am for their wonderful support and allowing me to do something that I totally enjoy. And working here with all these fine people was a great pleasure. And uh, I miss the people. Uh, I miss a lot of things. But uh, I didn't know this was happening tonight, so I've been kind of caught by surprise. But I appreciate it very much. I enjoyed what I did, and I enjoyed working here at James City County. A fine place, and it must be a fine place because there's a gentleman over here to my left that keeps leaving James City County and he keeps finding his way back, <laughs> Bill Porter. He's a great man, yes, he and, is. and uh, he keeps finding his way back. <laughs> Thank you all very much. Very, very humble. All right, Supervisor McLennan with um, Dr. Jack Edwards. And if you don't mind, I'd like uh, Edith Edwards to come up and join us too. Uh, uh, certainly any of us who've served in public office know that uh, we don't do this just as individuals. Our families have to uh, pay a pretty significant price as well. So, uh, all right, Edith, all right, fair enough. And the other thing you learn is to respect the wishes of that. <laughs> Uh, this is a great honor first to, to be here with uh, my good friend Carlisle Ford, uh, who's uh, served uh, for so long and so ably. And, but especially uh, to be here with Jack Edwards. Uh, uh, Jack and I had two years of overlap on the County Board of Supervisors, uh, but we had many years as colleagues together at the College of William Mary, and he was my boss as the uh, Dean of the Faculty of Arts and Sciences uh, uh, for a number of years as well. Uh, we have a resolution of appreciation for, uh, for Dr. Jack D. Edwards. Whereas Dr. Jack D. Edwards has uh, tirelessly served James City County citizens uh, with dedication and integrity since 1962, and whereas uh, more recently Dr. Edwards has served on the James City County Electoral Board for the past 16 years, and whereas Dr. Edwards also served on the James City County Board of Supervisors uh, for 28 years from 1972 to 2000. And whereas Dr. Dr. Edwards served on the faculty of the College of William and Mary 
for 30 years as president, uh, um, I'm sorry, as professor of government, uh, dean of the faculty of arts and sciences, and chairman of the Department of Government, and whereas Dr. Edwards has been uh, president of two statewide local government organizations, the Virginia Municipal League and the Virginia Association of Counties, uh, Virginia Association of Counties from 1977-78 and VML uh, from 1989-90, and whereas Dr. Edwards has also served as a member of the board of directors of Williamsburg Landing, as president of the Residence Council, uh, as a member of the uh, Leadership Historic Triangle Board, uh, it's, uh, uh, as chair of the Christopher Wren Association, and as the, for as the uh, former president of the Williamsburg Lawn Bowling Club, and as a national board member of uh, the uh, Lawn Bowling Organization, now further be it resolved that the Board of Supervisors of James City County, Virginia, hereby celebrates the, the retirement of Dr. Jack D. Edwards and expresses its appreciation for his legacy of leadership and service. Jack, congratulations. Thank you, Don. Uh, I spent a good many years on this Board of Supervisors, as you know, and uh, the county now, of course, is much larger. Your problems are much larger. <laughs> but I'm pleased to find out, as a result of the discussion of the past hour, the problems really haven't changed that much. <laughs> it's still dealing with uh, people and f trying to find compromise among people with quite different views. Um, I've spent the last 15 or 16 years on the electoral board. I've had the privilege of voting for all of your certificates of election. Uh, that's becoming a more important function, and it will be an important function for all of you to maintain as our citizens grow to have some doubts about that, that whole uh, operation. My term on that ended last month. Tonight, I'm just a member of the consent calendar. But in this, in this day of polarized po politics, that's not such a bad thing. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you both very much and your families. With that, we have two public hearings this evening. Um, one is the ordinance to amend and reordain Chapter 22 wetlands. I believe Liz Parman is going to start that off, and um, then I will open the public hearing. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Get that back to Paula. <laughs> All right, so as you're aware, the James City County Code of Ordinance is, contains a wetlands ordinance as authorized in Section 28.2-1302 of the Code of Virginia. Uh, this code section dic dictates the precise language under which a local wetlands board is authorized to operate. Um, that section was last amended in 2014. The county's wetlands ordinance was last amended in 2011. So as a result, uh, the county code is not entirely in line with the Code of Virginia. Uh, before you are proposed amendments to the county wetlands ordinance, uh, they correct minor grammatical differences add minor points of clarification, and they also add a living shoreline project, uh, projects as permitted uses in wetlands. Um, these revisions will not have a significant impact on the county's wetlands board, and there I would consider them simply housekeeping revisions. Thank you. Certainly able to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions for staff? So Ms. Palmer, what does the county attorney do? Just kind of come in one day and say, find something wrong with our ordinances? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a good question. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> no, I provide counsel to the- Initiation procedures. Yeah. <laughs> so I provide counsel to the wetlands and Chesapeake Bay boards and in my study of the ordinances and the Virginia code, I noticed that we were, there were a few things that needed to be corrected, so. Well, it's great. We uh, thought it pertinent to bring Great that up. to find uh, that uh, you're not found the material enough to notice that uh, we're not in compliance with uh, the code exactly. So appreciate the good work here. 
Oh, thank you. Questions? All right, with that, we'll open the public hearing. Do we have any speakers for that? No. All right. With that, we will close the public hearing. Thank you very much. Is there any discussion or is there a motion? Move the adoption of the ordinance amendment. Thank you. Mr. Porter? Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Hipple? Aye. Ms. Sadler? Aye. Ms. McGlennan? Aye. Motion carried. Uh, Ms. Larson? Aye. Motion carried. <laughs> okay, even if I'd said no, it would have been all right. Yeah. All right, with that, that brings us to S the public hearing of SUP 0014-2017, Yard Works SUP <coughs> Amendment, and Susanna Petrowski is um, going to give our staff, did I do your name okay? Savannah, but that was Savannah, good. I'm so sorry. That's okay. How Don't about worry. the last name? With the that was perfect. Oh, well, okay. About as good as that's anybody gets talking. it. Yeah, I, that's why I messed up Savannah, just yep. saying. So, um, Go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Mr. Kevin Martin has applied on behalf of Yardworks LLC for an amendment to an existing special use permit for the manufacture and sale of wood products on properties located at 3, 10, 20, and 100 Marclay Road, 164 Waltrip Lane, and one additional property with no assigned address. The operation involves grinding wood debris to produce, color, and bag mulch, with a small portion of the property being used for retail sales. The existing SUP, obtained by Mr. Larry Waltrip in 1993, permits the operation on approximately 105 acres, with a tub grinder located on 164 Waltrip Lane. Yardworks LLC has now taken over operation of the site, and as part of this transition, they've requested this SUP amendment in order to reflect the current boundaries of their operation on the master plan and to allow the operation of grinding equipment in additional areas. The proposed amendment would remove the Williamsburg Jamestown Airport from the existing SUP boundaries and decrease the total SUP acreage to approximately 49.9 acres. Staff notes that this that should this SUP amendment be disapproved, the existing SUP would remain valid and the operation could continue on the 105 acres currently permitted by the existing SUP. Staff conducted a sound test for the project in January. No noise associated with the grinding was audible from any adjacent properties visited by staff. However, beeping from vehicles on the site was minimally audible from some of the locations. Based on this test, combined with a proposed condition limiting the hours of operation, staff anticipates minimal auditory impacts to adjacent properties. These properties are all zoned R8, rural residential, with portions of the site also zoned airport approach overlay. The majority of the site is designated airport on the 2035 comprehensive plan land use map, with a small area designated low density residential. Principal suggested uses for areas designated airport include aviation, with airport related commercial and office development as secondary uses. In addition, land which is currently in use as a construction landfill and mulching operation may continue in its current or similar use in a manner consistent with state and local permits. The Planning Commission considered this application on February 7, 2008 and recommended approval by a vote of 5 to 0. Staff finds the proposal to be consistent with the comprehensive plan, the zoning ordinance, and surrounding development and recommends that the Board of Supervisors approve this application subject to the conditions listed in the resolution. I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. A representative from Yardworks is available for questions as well. Thank you. So Mr. Haldeman, did you have anything that you wanted to add? Uh, not really. Um, the Planning Commission unanimously uh, recommends approval of this. I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. I just have a question for uh, the representative from Yardworks, if, okay. I, if I could. Uh, Thank you, Mr. Haldeman. And I, I certainly um, intend to support the, uh, um, the SUP, uh, as, as Ms. Petrowski uh, indicated, uh, the um, uh, failure to do that would just keep the old one in place. But I did just want to take this opportunity to ask a question about uh, uh, whether the conditions uh, that are listed in this SUP will help to um, minimize the, uh, the possibility of a kind of uh, um, um, smoldering fire that we had last year uh, at, at the, um, the facility? Yeah, I, I believe it will. Um, I, I think there was a couple of reasons that that had happened. Um, I think the property had gotten out of control with mm -hmm. a lot of the uh, previous dumping and things like that. And while we were developing the back area, actually cleaning it up, we had to combine a lot of materials in one place. 
um, while we developed that. And we had just started dumping on that property that Friday, and we had a fire on Saturday, so we didn't really get a chance to clean that side up yet. But, yeah, I believe it will. There, there's proffers in place that the piles can be certain size and things like that that should help keep them cool and help us maintain, flip them, and keep them cool. Well, I'm, I'm sure that the, the, um, you would want to make sure that that, that uh, doesn't oh. happen again as, mu as much as anybody else. But I just I stay to on my phone three times a night looking at the cameras on that property for any any hot spots, fires, anything. Thank you. So, okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Any other questions? I need to open the public hearing. Are there any? Do we have any speakers for the public hearing? Seeing none. I'll close the public hearing. And I will look to the board for any comments. I move the adoption of the uh, SUP. Okay. Mr. Porter? Right. Mr. Sadler? Aye. Mr. Eisenhower? Aye. Mr. Hippel? Aye. Mr. McGlennon? Aye. Ms. Larson? Aye. All right. That brings us to board considerations. And we are going to hear uh, the, we have two contract awards for fire station HVAC replacements, but we will be voting separately. So we will hear fire station two HVAC replacement in the amount of 223,500 and the fire station five HVAC replacement 217.5. Um, and that will be presented by Mark Abbott. And, but we will vote for them separately. But that way you don't have to come up with the same information. Good evening. Good evening, Chairman Larson, members of the board, Mr. Porter, Mr. Kingsman. I'm Mark Abbott, operations project coordinator with general services in James City County. I'm here this evening in consideration of two HVAC replacement projects. The HVAC equipment at fire stations two and five are at the end of their life expectancy. General Services is proposing the replacement of these HVAC systems in these stations. These new systems will provide an increase in energy efficiency as well as an improvement in occupant comfort and humidity control. I'd be glad to answer any questions that you may have. Uh, are these, um, is this, this uh, funding in, uh, proposed in the next budget, is this money already set aside? Is it been, is it, I'm trying to figure out where this is going to fall in our, is it already in our budget or is it in the upcoming budget? Uh, these funds are currently in FY18. FY18, okay. Sir. Thank you. I've got a question. Um, normally we see a bidding list of who bid on this project when it goes over a certain amount and I didn't see that anywhere in, in the paperwork um, on either one of the stations. I know we need them but normally that size of project is bid out and I know it is with our BMPs and that sort of thing. Is there, was that bid out or is there a process or something I'm missing? Uh, no sir, it was not bid out. Uh, for the past six years I believe we have sole sourced uh, train equipment. Uh, the local rep for that is uh, to move ser services out of Chesapeake. Uh, one of the reasons for that through our purchasing agents and general services as well is to provide more of a uh, safety for James City County in housing the same type of equipment uh, throughout the vast variety of 60 commercial buildings that we have here in James City. Also including the control system that we monitor uh, daily, keeping that also uh, conducive to uh, one brand of equipment. And I understand where we're going and, and where we came from years ago and had multiple systems and couldn't find parts, couldn't find this, couldn't find people to work on it. We went with the lowest bid and, you know, and, and it messed us up. I know that question has come up to me of, of you know, was it bid out or not? Um, and I understand the, the thought process in order to make sure that we're the same across the board. So our systems aren't down any time. It's easier to repair them, it's easier to fix them. We've got the parts on hand, we can do everything. Um, how do we keep those numbers, these numbers in check as we go along? Being in construction, I know sometimes you use the same person and it bumps up year after year. How do we control that bump up or you know, what do, what do we have in place that, that may protect us and the citizens from paying a larger cost than maybe we should? We work in close relationship with uh, DeMuth Services. Uh, we are, are constantly uh, looking over their engineering processes, uh, their, their, their pricing as from, from job to job, not just uh, accepting this job because they are the sole sourcing, but looking at uh, many different um, 
sources of whether it's pricing, whether we bring them in for our energy efficiency, the, and also part of the uh, sole sourcing with uh, Demuth Services gives us, they bring their engineers in and constantly review uh, several of our buildings uh, to continue, whether it's uh, retro commissioning or um, you know those types of things. So we, we are constantly, for each project, looking over their engineering and looking at the types of equipment that they are Mr. Hipple, the a sole source is something that's very sort of unique. We don't do a whole lot of sole source contracting, particularly with anything this big. Uh, that's something that purchasing reevaluates every two years. And so I just double checked my list. It looks like we're going to reevaluate it again in July of this year. So we last did it in 2016. Uh, we operate under a terms and conditions um, that cover us for that year, uh, for that two year period. And it's certain guarantees by DeMuth and certain uh, benefits that they provide to us above and beyond just having a low bid and and I believe Mr. Abbott sort of went through that we get a lot of benefit from having one person and and one set of systems that everybody understands and knows but we do reevaluate that every two years right and I, I understand the, the benefit of it you know because there there is a big benefit that is unseen with this many systems and what we're doing um, but you know it, it, there's always a concern of a citizen how come this company gets this and Four of us over here, not me, but four other companies, I can't bid on anything, but four other companies in the community have to bid on a B&P at the same value, and I do a great job and I've done plenty for you. Why can't I continue doing all your B&Ps, and, and if you have a problem, I, they're all the same. So those are the questions I'm getting. You know, not saying this is, this is a, a wrong way of, of, of going, and, and because I know the benefits. I know what we had before this. And we went through some of this as while I was moving the train depot as far as the benefits that they're bringing to the community and to our buildings and that sort of thing. So it's just a hard, hard question to answer. It, it, <laughs> it, it is, and, and to be honest with you, it, it's hard to put a dollar amount to the, in the last five years, my previous job with James City County was uh, the head of the HVAC department. Right. And so, I have some, some vast knowledge in, in, in that, and, and I'll be honest with you, when, when, it, when it came about, it was the control system that really pushed us towards this sole source. We had many different varieties, and it was, it was an IT-based system, and it, it was just, it was very hard to, as you said, low bid, you, you get what you get sometimes, and so, you know, that, that pushed us to that point, but it, it's very hard to put a dollar number to the savings that James City County gets for that sole sourcing, you know, uh, the, the the dollars for the project, you know, are what they are, but the hidden dollars are our maintenance staff and the training that they receive and the, uh, the, the ability to work on the same type of equipment over and over and over and over again. And Mark, I know you worked on a lot of the systems prior to the position you're in now, and, and you know the problems and issues that we had before. And what I'm trying to do is almost an education for the citizens that ask the question is, you know, and you hit on it a little bit of, of what you had to do, what your team had to do in order to keep these systems up. Now that we have the controllers in place, it can be almost off site to figure out what some of these things are doing. How technical is it? I mean, at what benefit, tell, tell the citizens a little bit about the benefit of that system compared to what you had before and that might explain some of the savings and why we're going in the direction that we're going. So the control system that, that we run currently uh, through the, the train equipment uh, offers, us, offers us the ability, uh, especially with the buildings that are on that system, the, uh, to know when that system has a problem before the citizens or uh, people in the building know that there's a problem. I would say over the last at least five years, we've fixed problems in the county before there was ever a problem to fix, if that uh, makes any sense. So you know, that, that, that alarm system alarms us 24 hours a day. Uh, there's someone on call 365 that two o'clock in the morning, if there's a problem, someone is responding you know, to that problem. That, that is a big savings. Uh, one thing that 
truly helps us is that one small problem in the HVAC world can turn to a major problem if not taken care of at that moment. So th these alarms that, that come to us, albeit maybe small in, in some people's eyes, uh, we can save larger dollars by catching a smaller problem become, before it becomes a, a larger problem. Great, thank you, I, I appreciate that. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, no but I just wanted to you know, let the citizen know, and the ones asking the questions, why we're doing this and, and get as, no, as much information and, and knowing that you've done it before we had the systems in place and now working with the new systems, the benefits and the controls and what we can get to quicker and how we can get things, systems taken care of that instead of them failing and burning motors up and everything else and relay boards, we're hopefully getting to them a little quicker and we're saving that cost in the long run. And, and just so and just so you know, one, one added point to that, in, in the last decade, uh, we, you know, we, we have approximately 60 buildings in James City County ranging from, you know, 1,000 square feet to 70,000 square foot rec center. And we now currently have 20 buildings, uh, if these two uh, buildings pass on the control system being monitored 24 seven and with that millions of dollars of savings in you know in, in energy uh, due to these control systems and upgrade of HVAC equipment. Thank you. I would like to um, ask Mr. Kinsman uh, about the review process because I, I think one of the things that uh, Michael's driving at here is to make sure since we are sole source and we do have a chance to review it uh, one of the part of that is I it's looking for confirmation that part of that review process is to make sure that our our uh, costs are uh, still competitive. Is that part of what you consider uh, when you look at the at the uh, thing each every two years? It is. We with the the agreements. There's a set uh, a discount that is uh, included for all different types of jobs, uh, and is reviewed. The agreement's reviewed by purchasing and by general services director of general services as well. At least those are the two that I know. I don't know who else is involved in that particular group, but that is something that they look at. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, could we do a, um, a vote on the contract award fire station two HVAC replacement, or could we have a motion? Two, two, three, five hundred. Move. Thank you. Mr. Porter. Mr. McGlennon. Aye. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Mr. Sadler. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. Motion carried. With that. The motion for contract award fire station five HVAC replacement. So moved. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Ms. Eisenhower. Aye. Mr. McGlennon. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. And thank you very much. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Um, that brings us to a new chapter 12 conflict of interest and whistleblower um, that will be added to, or possibly added to the James City County Personnel Policies and Procedure Manual. Patrick T. Good evening. Good evening, members of the board and Madam Chair. I bring to you today a staff proposal for creation of Chapter 12, which would be titled Conflict of Interest and Whistleblower Policy. We would add this to the James City County Personnel and Policies Procedure Manual. We would do this to emphasize the importance of the Conflict of Interest Policy, which supports the Code of Virginia we are all required to follow, and it would add language we currently lack related to whistleblower protections, and it outlines the process for both citizens and employees to file any complaints. So to ensure the county is in compliance with both state law and federal and state government grants and funding opportunities, staff recommends approval of the change. Thank you. Mr. Teak, um, is this uh, policy uh, an in-house draft or was it modeled after some other localities or state guidance or anything of that nature? Yeah, it, well the first review that we did is Code of Virginia. So we reviewed the Code of Virginia for both conflict of interest and whistleblower. And then we looked at some of the recommended language from our grant funding agencies. Those are contained in a lot of our grant manuals that suggest here are some draft policies. Then we looked at other localities and through that process put ours together. 
seems very thorough and, and uh, well crafted. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Is there a motion? Move. Mr. Porter. Sadler. Aye. Ms. Levinen. Aye. Ms. Hipple. Aye. Ms. Eisenhower. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. Thank you. Um, and I should, I think what we're going to do is go, we're going to finish with our meeting and then we will go into the JCSA meeting because we have a closed session for that meeting. So that brings us to board requests and directives. I've got some items, if I may. Um, first of all, it's been a very busy month. I attended the neighborhood forum and heard a great presentation by uh, Mr. Porter and Ms. Mellon. Thank you so much. It was very well attended and it was very informational on our budget process. Also, I attended the EDA meeting and I also met with Mr. Marshall, Ms. Bledsoe, the chair and vice chairs, and discussed their budgeting requests. I attended the Arbor Day celebration with Mr. Eisenhower and Ms. Larson, and I also participated in Read Across America Day at Stonehouse Elementary, and I was honored to read to Ms. Padden's kindergarten class, and we read Dr. Seuss's Oh, the places that you'll go. It was lots of fun. And is this the time when, if I want to address something about the, um, the tax bill? This, okay. Um, so in addressing SB 942, the bill adding to our sales tax, I have some thoughts and ideas. Um, first, I agree with the many, many, many constituents who have contacted me regarding SB 942. I appreciate the... Um, the phone calls and the emails and, um, and the conversations. Um, I also oppose this legislation. Have con I contacted Delegate Pogge prior to her vote, asking her to oppose it, and I was informed that she too opposed it, thankfully, and voted against it. But if the governor should happen to sign it, um, this tax bill, sign this tax bill, I feel we're gonna need to give direction to staff regarding what should happen to this extra money when James City County receives it. I consider this money, for all intents and purposes, found money, if you will, not unlike new money from increased assessments. And I have some options that I'd like to propose and ideas to consider um, as we go through our budget process. First, our manufacturing base. I proposed we could reduce the machine and tools tax by up to 1.5 million. I believe this would send a strong positive message to manufacturers such as the brewery, Ball Container, who also depends on aluminum, uh, Owens, Illinois, who produces glass containers for the craft beer industry. And this is only to name a few. This would send the message that we are glad that they are here. The decisions regarding expansion, further investment, or even if they should remain in James City County are made elsewhere. Reducing the cost of doing business in our county will be favored favorably viewed at the home offices of these companies. In the last several years, WJCC schools have sponsored Manufacturing Day to encourage kids to consider these careers. Developing a young qualified workforce for manufacturing plus a redu reduced cost of doing business will in time grow this sector by encouraging other manufacturers to locate in James City County. This tax reduction could be a critical initiative with the future coming of Skips Creek Connector. Altogether, this could be very positive for our economic future. Um, secondly, the Business Professional Occupational License, or better known as the B-Pole Tax. I propose we could reduce the B-Pole Tax by 1.5 million. It's no wonder that our small business community dislikes this tax because it does in fact tax sales regardless whether or not your business has been able to make a profit. It inhibits startup businesses with initially little sales, but large expenses. As we all know, empty storefronts are a great concern to our citizens. While I don't presume that a people tax reduction would be salvation for all of our shopping centers, I do believe it could be a significant factor in solving the vacancy problem. Third, next, is the real estate tax. There are several ways to look at this. Our families benefit when there's strong and vibrant business and manufacturing in our community. This helps to keep our families' taxes down. If we can grow our manufacturing and business space, maybe, just maybe, our kids and grandkids won't have to leave James City County for better employment opportunities elsewhere. And James City County's top 10 taxpayers are all businesses. 
Can you imagine your tax bill if any portion of your manufacturing base were to leave this county? Without thought in mind, we could share reductions to our businesses and provide homeowners with a one cent reduction in their real estate tax. This helps a multitude of people in James City County and our families uh, that were promised tax relief when the last tax increase um, took place um, in the event that we had excess revenue. Or I'm also open to providing tax reductions solely on real estate based on the initial figure of 4.5 million in found money, which would be a equivalent to a three cent real estate reduction. Um, in conclusion, I think we should also take a, a, an extra look at security for our schools. If this bill is signed, we'll also be receiving an extra approximate, approximate a half million in grocery taxes. This could be added to any portion of a reduction to what I previously mentioned, or it could be added to our surplus budget revenue to accommodate the cost of security. Yes, there are many things we can spend this found money on, but at some point we need to stop the spending train and start refunding money to our community. And I look forward to our future discussions and hearing ideas during our budget process. And I thank you for the time, Madam Chair. I have uh, two items that I'd, I'd like to address. One will be the tax, uh, but I, before we do that, I, I had another item that I'd like to uh, um, ask uh, our staff to uh, to research for us if uh, if uh, the rest of you agree with it. Uh, and that is, uh, we received notice recently of a um, public comment period on a natural gas power generation plant to be located in Charles City County. And uh, I would like to request that staff uh, provide us with some briefing on the uh, nature of that facility, um, what kind of potential uh, benefits and or risks might be po posed by that power plant, uh, and if possible, to, to determine what relationship there might be to the power being generated by that plant and the demand for power that was the basis for approval of uh, the power lines across the James River, um, since uh, apparently um, there was here is an alternative way of generating some additional power uh, that was not uh, addressed er earlier on. I don't know the details of this power plant, but I would like to get some sense of it just so that we can have a clearer understanding of how much, in fact, uh, that proposal was, in, was really conditioned on that being the only means of providing additional power to the peninsula. Um, so I'd, I, I would hope that uh, board members are in agreement that we uh, can ask staff to provide that information to us uh, in, a, in a timely fashion so that we can uh, decide whether or not we want to take a public position on that uh, power plant. I believe that there will be a public hearing on April 9th uh, and that there, the comment period will be open to the latter part of April. Um, so uh, if we could uh, get something um, uh, in order for us perhaps to, to consider um, before the next, before the April meeting, that would be great, but uh, in any case, if we could at least have it um, in time for that, uh, I'd appreciate it. So um, I just asked for kind of, is there a consensus to go ahead and do that? Great, okay. Uh, and, and let me turn to the, um, to the issue of the proposed sales tax increase that uh, has now passed the General Assembly and is sitting on the governor's desk, as I understand it. Um, uh, this has been an, an issue on which I've uh, asked for some additional information a couple of times over the course of the last several months and uh, still have not really received uh, the, the kind of information that I was seeking. Um, I know that staff is, is, has a hard time getting some of this information because the, this was something that was in process, not quite finalized. And so uh, what I would uh, propose is that, uh, uh, and I, I think we're planning to discuss this issue at our next work session, uh, that uh, uh, we asked staff to address some specific questions, and the most important to me, of course, is what uh, share of the revenues generated uh, can reasonably be, be assigned to local citizens as opposed to uh, tourists uh, and visitors to the community. Uh, what the impact of that uh, uh, increase in, in sales tax might be expected to be on our retail establishments. Uh, uh, I would also like to know a little bit more about uh, whether any other localities in the Commonwealth 
uh, are um, taxed uh, in terms of their general population to support uh, the, the services of, of tourism. And uh, what the state has done in recent years in terms of providing tourism funding since the it could be argued that certainly the state is at least as much a beneficiary of the tourist industry as the localities in which that industry is located. Um, so those are just some, some initial questions that I'd like to see addressed for us. And what I'd, what I'd hope the board might uh, countenance doing today is, is just sending a brief message to the governor indicating that we do have a number of uh, questions that are still unanswered about the implications of this uh, legislation and that we ask him to uh, defer any positive action on the legislation until we've had the opportunity for our work session so that we can decide at that point whether the board as a, as a uh, corporate body wants to take action or whether other individual members of the board wish to express their opinion uh, to the governor before uh, legislation is finalized. Um, I would ask that if there are specific questions, um, address the first part first, um, that maybe we, we could follow up with those and, and maybe you already have in writing to staff. Um, I, Mr. Porter's over here furiously trying yeah, to right, uh, yeah. write them down, but if we could just follow up with a... Right, I'll, I'll certainly provide those in an email to, Thank you. to staff. Thank you. Yeah. So again, I, I'd ask if that's uh, something that uh, folks would be comfortable doing. I think we'll have our work session prior to his yeah. well, deadline. Well, yeah. deadline that he's got I, he has a deadline, so, so we could ask that, that he defer action on it until that point uh, uh, as opposed to uh, uh, taking action beforehand. He could always sign it uh, um, beforehand or veto it. And, I, and what I'd suggest is before he takes any positive action on it that, uh, that we um, have the opportunity to uh, get the answers to these questions. Right now, he has until April the 9th. Yeah, so we'll have a meeting before that. Right, we have the work session in the latter part of, what is it, the 26th, 27th? Right. Mm -hmm. 27th. So prior to his decision, mm -hmm. so that'd give us enough time. Potentially. Right. That's why I wanted to, to communicate uh, after this meeting uh, our request that he defer action on it until after that point. Did you have, have uh, that done from the county administrator on behalf of the board, or are we just looking for the board chair or what? Uh, I think the, maybe the board chair could uh, could sign that letter. What do we, I mean, if, if he's got to the 8th, I don't understand. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's out of our hands. It's above our pay grade. Mm -hmm. I mean, if we need to. Yeah, I think the basic point would be to, to uh, perhaps provide him with some additional information based on our research of the question as to the implications for the community. think it would be um, appropriate uh, to board would so desire to basically say we although the deadline is you know the uh, April 9th uh, that we would ask to give us an opportunity to evaluate this at a work session that he uh, we, we request he defer any any uh, uh, action on it until after such time as if we've had an opportunity to meet, discuss it, and maybe provide additional input to him. Um, I know I've in the put my name out there already saying I ask him to veto it, but uh, right. Uh, I would I would also point out that remember the governor has the ability to sign, to veto, or to amend. Right. So and I know that you know I'm I'm just I'm trying to right. go through this in my mind because when we get enabling or when we get legislation that comes down and says you will do this for the school and the governor signs in place. This board that I know of since I've been on it, we haven't gotten in front of that. Now we're getting in front of this. I wonder what's the difference, because when they give us that, our citizens have to pay that and it's like, guys, you're gonna do this and you figure out how to pay for it. And so I'm trying to figure out why w then we don't take stands on that, but we're saying, can you wait on this well, yeah. Th those are yeah. just questions yeah. that I'm... Right. I, I think we do actually take stands on that. We, we, in our legislative program, indicated a number of areas where we uh, requested that the state take uh, certain actions to provide more funding or uh, to take on more responsibility or to free us from some mandates that they had applied. So we do routinely tell them that. But, but even so, this is, a, this is an unusual case um, because 
when we're talking about school funding, we're talking about a system that's applied across the entire Commonwealth uh, for a basic service that is uh, um, provided to all of our citizens. Uh, when we're talking about uh, this particular uh, initiative, this is, you know, actually it's, it's making a decision for us about priorities and, and expenditures to, um, to the benefit of a particular interest. And I think that's really what, what uh, means that we have a special responsibility to our citizens just to explain to them what we think is going on with it and, and uh, how, I, how to I address it. I agree with some of that, but the, yeah. the I don't think it's to a, a certain interest or a certain group because it helps the entire community. And I think it could have been rolled out a little differently, but you know that the nothing up in, in Richmond is rolled out much differently than, than they put it on the floor and they, and they move forward with it. Um, no question. But, <laughs> you know, and, and the things that we've been scrapped with, I mean, this is, this is what we've been talking about and saying, hey, Richmond, pay attention. We're scrapped. You're, you're sending more things down. We're having to raise our taxes up. We're having to do this. We're having the things we can do to stay afloat. We're spending more money on school, and we're getting less money from Richmond. Now there is something coming down that says, okay, you're going to get more money, and we're like, we don't know if we want it. I'm just trying to figure out what, what yeah, well, we're sending Yeah, well, out. quite frankly, that's not exactly what we've ever asked for. We've asked for the authority to make decisions about whether or not we are able to fund the services that we feel are necessary. We're not, we're, we're not asking for uh, money to be given uh, to us along with directions about exactly how it's going to be spent. Um, so that sometimes happens. We sometimes get money with those purposes, but, right. that's, but that's not necessarily what we've asked for in the past. Um, so I, I, and, and I, I certainly uh, understand your reticence to, to, to address this in, in the way that I've suggested. And I would say that, you know, um, if there's not consensus on it, then I'm perfectly fine with just saying, you know, well, I'll write and, and suggest this to the governor and any other board members who want to take that same position can do so. If anybody who doesn't, that's fine too. And, and, and I'm okay if we want to have a special meeting. To, to go over this because I think that I think there's a lot of things that I have in here that I want to talk about and um, as far as what's going on here um, right. you know there there's there there's there's this tax of possibly 4.5 million the first year possibly six and move it up after that that I've heard different figures. I don't know if the figures are exactly right, but those are some of the figures that have been put out. Well, it's actually $9 million, right? Um, half of which would- Total, yes. Right, half of which would go to um, tourism advertising. Right, right. tourism. Right. But if, we, if, if, if you think about it, our biggest thing is tourism. And if we lose one or two or three of our tourism drawers, then when we go back to tax the citizens, it's gonna be a heck of a lot more than what we're talking about here because they're going to have so, to carry that. Uh, but, but I'm not asking you to, to decide whether you think it's a good thing or not today. What but I'm asking, we, asking is, can we suggest to the governor that we need a little bit of time to understand yeah, the implications? That's all, that's all find now, again, if, if, if there's not agreement on the board to, to do that, that's fine with me, and I'll, I'll just go ahead and, and... If we can... I don't have a problem with... As long as we're not sending a message out, we're thinking one way or the other. Okay. I right. want to have the meeting first, and I want to see what each member's talking about. And, right. and you know, if we say, hey, we're, we're going to have a meeting on, uh, I think it's the 27th, can this be, you know, is that something that can be delayed till after we have a chance to talk about okay. amongst That's the five? That's all I think we, we're looking for. Yeah. Could right. you, um, could, uh, Supervisor McGlennon, could you mm -hmm. write up suggested language and sure. send uh, that out? I know. Yes. So let's decide. So we're so we're not doing it by email. Right. If if the language is agreeable, you you've said your piece that you would like to make sure that we say in there. If if the language is is something that that you think you can um, agree with, then you can give me a call and we can get that sent out. Does that sound? Yeah, reasonable? I can tell you it will it will say something. Uh, the draft that I would suggest would say something like this that. Uh, uh, the Board of Supervisors of James City County have heard from a number of our citizens and have uh, uh, also uh, uh, 
identified um, specific issues and questions related to the Senate bill uh, that we would like to have the opportunity to further investigate. We understand that you have until April 9th to make a determination about whether you will sign, veto, or amend that legislation. We would request that you, de that you defer action on that legislation until uh, we have had the opportunity for a work session on March 27th, after which we would communicate to you uh, our findings. So now on, so that does open up a, a, us a little bit because on the 27th, are we going to come to a consensus on whether or not, uh, and right. we may not right. <laughs> come to a consensus. Right. Come to a vote. That's um, right, that's right. Well, I said, yeah, and, and but, so that's why I, I But then know, we're, the we're, we're, we're taking was findings as opposed to the findings. position. Okay, because then we would be making an opinion on something we have no control over. Right. That's correct. So, um, so I just want to be careful there because we didn't, we didn't do it. So if we were to go back and send a letter and say, this is what at our work session, we discovered that we could da, 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 with this legislation and just the facts, I guess, is what you're saying. Right. Is there a potential chance that we would not hear back from anyone by our work session? Do you think? Oh, I, I don't. You mean from staff? I doubt. I no, know. no, I don't. Not from our staff. I mean, from Richmond. Oh, from Richmond. Oh, I'm. <laughs> well, so, yeah, sure, it's possible. Yeah, yeah so I mean, we're, all, yeah. all we're saying, we're, we're just making a request. We're not, we're not saying you have to do this, yeah. right? A together. request which could be promptly ignored. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> yes. Right. But that's kind of, you know, that, that's where we are. <laughs> anyway. Okay. Yeah. Um, so then, at that time, we would decide whether we wanted to send a a joint letter or just send individual one. Is that what, is that, yeah, okay, I mean, at that I, point? I, I think it would entirely at that point be, be a matter of, well, what, is, what do the facts tell us and do we have an agreement on what, what uh, position we would have or do we just want to communicate that we had this meeting, these are the issues that were raised uh, and uh, that the board did not take a position on, uh, on this as a, as a group, uh, though individual board members may communicate their, or may or have already communicated their opinions to you. Right, we should. We should point out probably at this time that, that we did not send something as a board um, in support of this legislation um, yet. Uh, the other two localities did do so, but we, we did not, we have not sent anything yet as a board. So now let me ask staff a question. Um, we're talking about two weeks. You're going to probably be getting a lot of questions, some of that you might be able to answer some of them you may not, but do you think you'd be able to get a large amount of them answered I by the I think so. Okay. I, I think so, because I think we know what's, we have the law now, or the bill now, as it's final, you know, what's gone to the governor. Okay. So I think we can answer some of those questions. Okay. Okay. Um, I'll try to be brief. I've uh, went to a, a bunch of things uh, since the last meeting. Uh, <laughs> The Heart Safe presentation was a very interesting, and then Ms. Sadler and I managed to sit through the uh, presentation from the, the Pottery about their plans. Um, I think <laughs> yeah, more than that. you two went. <laughs> yeah, I think all of us did, but we, 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 were, we were the tag team uh, last, right, I think. We were the last that. ones. So um, the a couple of other very important uh, meetings, uh, the Peninsula Council for Workforce Development is uh, having some issues with their... Uh, not the federal side, but the non-federal side from uh, from grants and, and donations from businesses, and they're having to uh, make some tough decisions on financial uh, cutbacks. So we're uh, working uh, working that. I'll be going to a meeting literally every month on that. Uh, school liaison, um, Mr. Larson and I attended the first one, and we were very successful. I think we've reestablished con uh, connection. We've set a schedule for meeting. We've uh, outlined. Uh, uh, steps that we think are necessary to try to get us in agreement and educated on, on issues that will help us when it comes to our budgeting process um, because that line of communication really has to be open. I was very pleased. Uh, we have a follow-on, I think, uh, coming up toward the end of this month as well, so we'll be meeting to, uh, more frequently. Um, neighborhood Forum was a very good presentation. I think the, the citizens were waiting with bated breath to listen to Mr. Porter talk about the budget. Uh, very well received. Uh, Arbor Day Awards, um, 
yesterday, uh, Ms. Uh, Larson and I went and uh, listened to some citizens down at one of her neighborhoods uh, about issues that they're having with their community. And then uh, I was, think, the last one to go in and talk to the EDA folks today. So is there, is there anybody else who hasn't? Because I think we've all, all I've had, I've had the I've discussion. I've got a meeting you, scheduled you've got on Monday. One more meeting, so, so we've all been doing that. I did have one input from a citizen uh, about our signs, about people panhandling. Uh, apparently, uh, the R Richmond Road at uh, Old Town is being worked very extensively now. And I've spoken to Jason. Uh, apparently, we had some signs in reserve, so they're going to go up there. Uh, the big issue there that I would like to have staff look at is apparently th with the multi-lanes of traffic with a double left turn lane, we've actually had people walking across two or three lanes of traffic to collect money. And it's a real safety issue. Um, and so, you know, when they step off the median into traffic and become a safety issue, I think the police need to be able to, you know, say, look, this is not very smart. And I think we need to back off a little bit. Um, I will say that um, I, uh, I'm the guilty party. I'm the one who went ahead and sent my letter into the governor. Um, and I asked him to veto it. And my reasons were listed in the letter. Um, what bothered me most was the process that uh, that our citizens were not really involved in. And to a great degree, we weren't that as involved as, involved as I think we should have been. Um, and it's been reflected in, in the uh, emails and the calls I've gotten. Uh, the citizens, regardless, are, are pretty much unanimously opposed to this. And I think a lot of it has to do with the process. Um, I think there is a basic problem with our tourism funding. Uh, we have been throwing a lot of money over a lot of years. Uh, into a, a structure and an organization to try to deal with tourism. And I do not see that we're getting concrete or positive results for the investment that we've made. And I think structural and financial changes need to be made. Unfortunately, I think this bill started out that way, but it didn't wind up that way. So um, I'm not, I don't have a great deal, deal of confidence that uh, throwing more money at the problem is gonna solve it. I think it's a little more basic than that. And I think we need to look at it from that point of view. And so I, I, I look forward to staff and presentation and for us having a conversation about this at the work session, and I'll let it go at that. Thank you. All right, I guess I'm up. <laughs> um, yes, I also met with the EDA and um, went over that, and um, PDC, TPO, personal budgets, um, pottery meeting as well, um, you know, and, and to get back, I'm not going to dwell on you know, this, what the governor will or won't do or sign or anything else. I will dwell on it's up to the five members here to work as tight and close as we possibly can to figure out, you know, if if the governor does sign this into effect, what we can do and what we can't do. And some of this money is going to be earmarked to do certain things. Well, then maybe we can take some of the other money we have in some other areas and do other things with it. And I think that's the conversation we need to have on the board is figure out, okay, how do we cut this up? And, and if this is, if this is going to be put in our laps, how do we cut it up for the best use for the citizens? And does a certain amount of money go back? I've talked to a lot of citizens, asked if we give you $20, $60 back, and would that help? Um, penny here, penny there. Michael, I'd rather see you put it into something that's more valuable to the county and to me than to give me $20 back. He said, now if you give me $1,000 back, I'm, we're talking like something. But um, so we gotta look at what a penny, what two pennies, what three pennies will do and, and, and what we can do. Um, we're, you know, our, our, um, our bonds and all are getting better. We're paying down our debt, so that puts us in a better position. We need to look at that. What is the difference in that? What, what, are we, what are we collecting? What are we putting in? I also asked um, the county administrator, I said, if, if, you know, Florida, God help that it never happens here and bless the people that are, that are having to deal with all that there. I'm, I feel so sorry for what they've gone through there. I can only imagine. One of the safest communities that said on the paper, one week, and the deadliest shooting, the next. So I asked him, I said, if we leave our resource officers where they're at and we position one officer in each school and what would that cost be to the citizens and what would we look at? 
that cost would be for the first year 16 sworn officers, you're looking at $2,160,000. By the second year, because you've got to train them and everything else, by the second year that dropped to $1,040,000. That's a, that's quite a bit of drop, you know, you're, you're, you're dropping down there pretty good, but the problem is paying for that. We've never been able to pay for that. I'm not saying we, you know, this is a way to pay for that, but that's an option on the table. And I asked a couple of people, what would you think if I gave you money back or I put an officer at the door and had the only way into the school and you had to pass by a, a armed officer underneath our cheese position? He said, Michael, you can keep a penny. I give you a dollar to keep the kids safe, and I don't have one kid in James City County. And each person I talk to tells me the same thing. Hopefully it'll never happen here, but all of us across the entire United States are playing this game that we hope it'll never come on our doorstep. That's what happened to Florida. I mean, because you don't have the money. We don't have the funds. It's very hard to get the funds to do this. This may be an opportunity to use some of those funds to protect these children. I mean, they're the ones taking care of us when we're, as we're aging. They're, they're our next stars right there. They, they're the ones we need to protect. And, you know, can't always keep everything safe, can't be 100%, but it's something that I wanna talk to my other board members, and we sent that information out on the 12th to the board members so that they would know the costs and that sort of thing of what we're looking at. And it was just a question, would this be something we could do? Is this an opportunity now to stand up and say, we'll take some of this money and put towards our schools and make sure our schools are safe. And, you know, it gives an opportunity as well to have an officer at the door and you start, this is generational, where all of a sudden the officers are not bad guys. They're talking to the kids and the parents and everything as they're dropping kids off. And I haven't heard, just to let you know, not one board member has said, no, we don't want to do that. They said, yeah, that's, that's an option we'd like to, you know, we're looking at, we're not deciding anything. I'm not speaking for this board, and there's been a lot of options on the table and whether we cut, how much we cut, how much we add, whether we add, if the governor signs, if the governor doesn't sign. We may be here next month and the governor not signing, and this is all done. So, you know, if it's not, we five are gonna work together to try to make sure that we listen to the citizens and we figure out what we give back what we use, what we put in other places, what we need to do, and it, it's going to take it's going to take a lot of work on us. And um, but I think you know, I think you'll be happy with the outcome when we finish. I think we'll do a, a fine job. We got a lot of good, strong, strong-minded, and strong-willed people <laughs> up here, so we'll fight for our causes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I attended just about, I'm sure you don't want me to go through the whole list, so uh, just about everything that they all did, except I was, I was out of town for the pottery, so I missed out on that, so I'll get one of you to update me that. Um, I know that there was some back and forth about the community budget dates, but didn't know if those were firm. I looked back through, so April 12th, Legacy Hall at 6.30, and April 16th at Croker Library at 6.30 p.m. and we'll all be together at those, well, as many if somebody can't make a meeting, but um, rather than individual meetings. So if citizens want an opportunity to be able to come in and look at the budget and speak to us, that's, that's the time to do it. Or you can speak with us at any time. Our phone numbers and email are on the website. Um, I had, I do have some questions regarding um, the budgeting process and if um, that that would be great if they could be available by that um, by that work session um, realistic um, outlook and I'm sure you're it's probably part of your um, budgeting process already but a, a realistic look at um, our financial needs moving forward if you know how long we were okay at our um, forgetting about this tax, you know, with our property tax that we're currently, you know, how are we, how are we looking there? Um, what are you hearing from the schools? I mean, I don't, 
think we'll get a picture of that on Friday, but um, talking about their future, they're talking about expansion on three, um, three of the high schools. Um, so, you know, what's, what's the outlook there? And um, I will try to get whatever else ones I sent to you. Um, but and those are the, the main ones that I had. I also ha wanted to know, I know that um, Ms. Mellon has spoken to us in the past about some items that are mandated that we are not funded on, and I wanted to know the percentage of what's, what if, what's been the percentage that we've had to pick up, maybe average five years on both the school side and the, um, on the county side as well. I know there's some, um, I believe some law enforcement that we talked about last year, some expenses we've, we've picked up there. But um, I did hear that the state was providing 25% um, on, for schools, uh, and I wanna make sure that's correct, and local levels picking, because federal level picks up very little. Um, make sure that, are we picking up 70? Um, there, there are, Personnel in both the the uh, regional jail and the sheriff's department has, that we have picked up uh, that you know the local government has picked up and, and I want to make sure right now, there there are positions for example at the uh, regional jail that are totally that the state compensation board uh, we meet those criteria for this uh, X number of, of uh, personnel but they'll only fund Y, so we picked up that difference. That's what we'll get to you. The other thing that happens with that is if the state mandates an increase in pay, then it goes, you have to deal with everybody. You just can't say, okay, it's easy. Right, right, right. you can't just deal with Y. Yeah. You yeah. gotta give X. Yeah. So um, those are the type of questions that if, that if we could get that type of um, answers, that would be great. And um, I had something else. Oh, I, it's been mentioned that, um, that this bill sits on the governor's desk. But if more information is wanted about the information, if you, uh, about the bill, if you go to virginiaassembly.gov, um, and would it be through the Senate bill, which was, it was 942, correct? Does anybody remember off the top of their head? SB 942. SB 942, if you search box. that, yeah. you can see the, um, the bill. Make sure you're picking up the, the ER version, which is the enrolled version. Okay. That's the last, there's, I'm on it right now, there's three different versions. The one that went to the Senate, there was a substitute, and then you have bill text as passed both. Okay. So make sure you pick up SB 942 ER. ER, okay. And there are differences in each one. So I would encourage um, people to go there. Uh, we are scheduled for a closed session. I don't know. Can I just ask, Madam Chair, if, if, uh, oh, if anybody <laughs> feels a need to do the closed session, or can we just go ahead and do it in open session, session right now? Yeah. If everybody's okay with that, yeah. If, okay. If so, um, I would like to, to move that uh, we appoint uh, John Grants and Sanford Warner to vacancies on the AFD committee with no expiration date for those terms. Apparently that's the, <laughs> that's the uh, way the AFD is yeah. structured. Okay. Once you, it's Women like Hotel Hawaii. California. <laughs> 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 All right. And so do we, let's, we wanna do that one first. All righty. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Ms. McLennan. Aye. Mr. Hippel. Aye. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. And I would move the appointment of Lawrence Golson to the Social Services Advisory Board uh, for a term which would expire on April 11th, 2021. Mr. McLennan. Aye. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Mr. Sadler. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. So with that, if there is a motion to adjourn, we are going to adjourn this meeting, but we are going to immediately go into our James City Service Authority Board of Directors meeting. Move so adjourn till Friday, uh, yes. March 16th at 9 a.m for the purpose of uh, meeting with the school board and city council. Now, I skipped right over the reports of the county administrator. Oh, oh, Thank yes. you, Mr. Hipple. Yeah, right. <laughs> so sorry. He was pretty happy till you caught it. Uh, well, you, you have the re report in your board package if you have any questions. 
be glad to try to answer them. Uh, you all had a lot of questions. Uh, just think about the nightmare of trying to budget. <laughs> you know, this, yeah. this is not an e easy task right now. No. Uh, on uh, March the 27th, we'll have the 21st annual can uh, candlelight vigil at King of Glory Lutheran Church. Uh, Chief Ryan will be there, and this is sponsored by the Child Abuse Prevention Coalition of Greater Williamsburg. And it's for there will be candles out for victims of child abuse in, during the last last year. Also, social services will be hosting an understanding your credit workshop. So that uh, have a low credit score, I just wonder what the deal is with the credit the co uh, concept. Join the James City County Social Services staff uh, on understanding uh, credit workshop be held Tuesday, March 20th at 6 p.m. at the Human Services Center at 5249 Old Town Road. And that's the... Okay, before you make that motion, I do want to, I, I meant to mention this, that we had been contacted by Sienna Ferguson, who is, I believe, the student body president of Warhill, and I, I may have that um, student council president at Warhill High School. She had asked us to participate in um, the walkout at their school, and she and I went back and forth a couple, not in a, in a, in a detrimental way, but went back and forth about, because I am, at the time, was not sure what the school division's um, policy was or procedures on that day, and did not feel it was appropriate that we um, show up necessarily if it was not something the school division was sanctioning, you know, that w here we came and, and, and did the wrong thing. And so, and I believe in a, in a letter that I received from the school system as a parent that they are holding those to students only um, due to safety. And so, but I did want to, um, I appreciate the thoughtful dialogue that I had with this student and, um, you know, I, she, she reached out to us and I didn't, I did not want, um, I, I just appreciate her, her um, she was very respectful and polite um, when we, when I said, you know, it's, it's just not something um, without the school division sanctioning that I can only speak for myself, but, it, but especially now without, um, with, the, with the school division has put out that it will be student only. So I just wanted the, the students from, to understand because I did see also in the paper where it was noted that the, the Board of Supervisors had been invited to participate. So I wanted people to understand where we were coming from. So without, um, without us taking a position on that at all. So, um, and so Supervisor McLennan, if you wanna go ahead with that adjournment. Okay, so I move uh, that we adjourn to uh, March 16th at 9 a.m. at Legacy Hall for a joint meeting with the school board and the city council. Mr. Glennon. Aye. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Ms. Eisenhower. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. With that, I'll adjourn. Thank you. <laughs> and we will call to order this meeting of the James City Service Authority Board of Directors for a regular meeting. Mr. Powell, good evening. Good evening. No, Mr. McGlennon. No. Here. Mr. Eisenhower. Here. Mr. Hipple. Here. Ms. Larson. Here. Ms. Sadler. Here. Um, public comment? Any speaker cards this evening? None? With that, we have our consent calendar, minutes adoption, February 13, 2018, regular meeting. Um, would anyone like to pull that, or is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Voice vote? Voice All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. We're good with that. Any public hearings, sir? Uh, no, ma'am. All right. And with that, we're into board considerations. Can I get a motion to enter into a closed session for the purpose of consultation with legal counsel employed or retained by a public body regarding a specific legal matter regarding the provision of legal advice by such counsel regarding the position of general manager and pursuant to section 2.2-3711A8 of the Code of Virginia. So moved. Mr. McGlennon. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Mr. Hipple. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Closed session.
said we would talk about. Uh, roll call vote, please. Mr. McGlennon. Aye. Mr. Eisenhower. Aye. Ms. Trapel. Aye. Ms. Larson. Aye. Ms. Sadler. Aye. Now we have board requests, re requests and directives. Anyone have anything for anybody? All good. Uh, general manager's update, Mr. Powell. I do have a few items. I'll be as brief as I can. Uh, one, I just wanted to reiterate the James City Service Authority's customer service counter will uh, stop collecting uh, payments at the counter uh, at 4 p.m. effective April 2nd. So that is a, a slight change. We currently uh, accept payments until 4.30, um, but effective April 2nd will go back to um, 4 p.m. Um, we do have a, a drop box uh, that's available 24 hours a day, as well as obviously people can pay online um, or, uh, or through mail. So I, I don't believe it will impact customer service, um, but I think it will improve um, employee security. So. Um, secondly, I don't, I don't normally recognize uh, 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 employees who are retiring at this meeting, um, but we do have a retirement coming up with one of our JCSA employees that I thought it was uh, important to recognize. Um, and no, it's not, it's not Mr. Oh, good. Poe. He's here. He's here. <laughs> I saw everyone looking at him. He's here for a different reason. Um, and I, uh, um, George Adams, who has oh. been our operations administrator okay. for just under 26 years, uh, is retiring April 1st. Uh, I would have asked George to be here with us tonight, but he's actually out of, currently out of town. Um, but despite the fact he couldn't be here, I did want to recognize him um, with you all. Um, for a quarter of a century, uh, George has been the operations administrator at the JCSA, um, and he has overseen uh, many improvements uh, in JCSA's operations, significant improvements over the years, um, primarily in the uh, safety uh, area and the maintenance areas. Um, and uh, it would really be uh, difficult to, to tell you all of his accomplishments in a brief period of time. But needless to say, he will be hard to replace. Uh, and I did just, um, you know, with someone who's been with us for as long as he has and made the contributions he has, I wanted to recognize them here at the board meeting tonight. So, um, <clears throat> lastly, <clears throat> uh, as part of the general manager's update, I wanted to take just a minute to further the conversation we had at the last meeting and specifically uh, maybe address some of Mr. Hipple's comments and concerns at the meeting um, about setting aside funds for future repair and replacement of our infrastructure. Uh, I'm going to show two slides um, that are a result of our asset management planning. Um, one is for our water infrastructure and one is for our wastewater infrastructure. And these slides show our projected expenses um, for repair and replacement of our infrastructure for the next 60 years. Um, I'd ask that you not focus on the specific dollars <laughs> or the specific years. Um, what's important here is the, to focus on the trends and How not the sp know? specific Please numbers. Please note we won't be here then. <laughs> that's right. That's right. <laughs> Please don't let them blame John us. John might be, but we won't. <laughs> um, so the first slide is our annual water replacement needs. And as you can see from this slide, for the next 10, 15, maybe even 20 years, the expenses are fairly stable. Um, but we do get to a period of time where the expenses do um, increase uh, rather dramatically. Um, and, um, you know, again, it, it's not the specific number. When we get closer to that time frame, we'll certainly be reevaluating and try to smooth some of those trends out. Um, but the point here is that with our, our infrastructure is still relatively new. And as it ages, it's going to uh, increase in the cost to um, to repair and replace. Uh, the second slide um, shows our wastewater annual replacement needs. Basically the same trends, uh, fairly stable for the next 10, 20 years or so. Um, unlike the water needs, which really kind of spiked in the middle of the 60 year time frame, the spikes in the sewer uh, annual replacement needs are, are, are a little bit further out uh, in that time frame. Um, but nevertheless, uh, the point here is that there are going to be significant needs in the future. And I, I just wanted to show these charts because I think they, they show in a very visual way um, what we've been talking about, which is uh, the, the, the bubble that, that's going to be coming. And, and I think that these, these graphs show um, the importance of planning today uh, for the needs of tomorrow. Uh, I asked our chief engineers to be here um, to further discuss uh, uh, briefly um, what is entailed in our asset management planning efforts. 
Uh, Mr. Vergakis is our chief water engineer. He's on jury duty today, so he could not be here. Um, but Danny Poe, who is our chief wastewater engineer, is here, and he's going to take just a few minutes to talk about what asset management planning is and how it feeds into these, to these graphs. So, Danny? Madam Good Chair, evening. board member Good Stanley. Evening. So, Mr. Powell has provided information relating the magnitude of the costs and when we might expect uh, those expenditures to occur to replace our aging wastewater and sewer water infrastructure. But when it comes down to planning and managing that work, it must be done at the asset level, project by project. And so we've begun to, and we continue to work on an asset management program at the Service Authority. The first uh, requirement of this program is to know what our assets are and where they are located. And to accomplish this, we use our geographic information system, our GIS. That's an informed mapping system. Uh, we have over 150,000 assets currently in our GIS uh, system. It's uh, uh, things such as pipes and valves and hydrants and manholes and various components of uh, water and sewer facilities. And each one of those assets has pieces of information attached to it within embedded in GIS. And uh, th things like the date it was installed, uh, the type of pipe, whether it's PVC or ductile iron, the diameter of the pipe, uh, the motor horsepower on a pump, or the kilowatt output of a generator. All of this data accumulates to over 5 million pieces of information associated with those over 150,000 assets in GIS. So the next tool that we have in our, our toolbox at our disposal uh, for our is our information management system. And we use a software that was developed by a company known as Infor. Our information management system tracks routine, preventative, and emergency uh, repair and replacement of assets. It stores details of the work that's been performed and it tracks the costs for labor and equipment, parts, and even contract services. And we also more recently have been uh, including information relating to asset condition that might help us predict uh, future performance of assets. And then the final thing that, uh, that we have uh, that we use in our asset management program is a very uh, detailed and intricate uh, spreadsheet. It was um, modeled and based off of a prototype created for EPA by one of their technical consultants and uh, allowed for public utilities to use and modify at their discretion. And so we've taken that and we've, we've modified it for our specific needs. The spreadsheets are populated with data from GIS and from our information man management system um, and also from field inspections. It applies useful life assumptions, replacement rehabilitation costs, and inflation factors for the coming years. It considers uh, risks and consequence of failures. Uh, we we uh, have some as assets that we can run to failure, uh, and we want to do that. We want to make sure we get every bit of life out of an asset we can, but some have higher risk and higher consequences of failure, so we want to make sure that we replace those before they fail. And so it also uh, cons cons considers the asset condition based on performance history and maintenance records and field observations. And then finally, it predicts the replacement or rehabilitation timing and those costs. And the goal of this program is to optimize the life of the assets to get as much life out of that asset that we can. We can extend it uh, to any extent at all. We want to do that. And of course, then uh, uh, responsibly plan for those future costs that we know are going to be coming. And so that is a very cursory review of our asset management program. I would like to invite, if any of you are interested, uh, to come down to our office and sit down. We'd give you a, a de more detailed demonstration of uh, the spreadsheets and the GIS and how all this uh, works together so that uh, you can see how it is already informing our, uh, our budget process at the JCSA. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very Good thing he's not retiring. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> well, you know, actually that segues into what I was going to make as my uh, concluding remark. Um, Mr. Vagakis is not here, but uh, Mr. Vagakis and, and Mr. Pope both have about 20 years of experience uh, with the JCSA as our chief engineers. Uh, now Mike uh, left for a while and came back, but, uh, but still about 20 years each total. And um, they work mostly behind the scenes. Uh, but their professionalism um, and, um, and their uh, expertise serve this community very well. Um, and uh, um, uh, as you can tell, this is, uh, this is a monumental effort to keep track of all this. And um, it, th there's a lot of work that we still have left to do, um, but we're making a lot of progress. I would very much appreciate the opportunity to come. Sure. I would as well. When okay. we have That'd opportunity. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I appreciate the reports that you'll give us. About <laughs> 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 yes, we will. <laughs> that concludes my update. Okay, very good. Well, with that, do I have a? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, what I know, we put we try to put away 12 percent uh, service authority for basically call it rain day fund. What percentage do, you, do we put away in the service authority yearly? I mean. Is it, is it 12 the same with the county? No, we don't necessarily follow that 12% a rule. Um, <clears throat> we, we don't, I'm trying to recall, we, we adopt, or you adopted a financial policy uh, about a year ago right. that sets some targets. Um, and I don't remember off the top of my head what those targets are. I'll, I'll dust it off and, and get back okay. with you. But we, but we do have a financial policy that, that addresses um, some of those targets. And is that, and, and is there a way maybe that you can bring back to us if we do put away X amount for these later years out and, and do what we're doing with the county, just, just making us stronger, putting us in a better position. Mm -hmm. So when these things do come up, cause they're going to come up, mm -hmm. we know it. Mm -hmm. I mean, right. we can hope that it's going to last 20 years and 10 years later, we're like, right. can't afford that. Right. Um, and it happens in our daily lives. So I'd like to be able to, you know, see us position the service authority the same way that the county is. And, and you know, I know y'all are positioned in strength now, but become stronger and go, okay, if we do have any funds that we can set aside and start putting in that fund that we know is going to come, right. that investment's just going to grow over the years. Right. But we got to figure out a way, too, that, that we can protect that investment for future boards, they, they don't come in and go, okay, let's take this and use it over here now and do this. Right. So you know, there's yeah. a little bit of thought and, process in there. And that's that's exactly what we have started doing. We, we actually have added a line item in the budget called the Repair and Replacement Fund. So it's very transparent and it shows how much money we're putting in that fund every year. And it's very specific for yes. that. Yeah. Yes, yes. And so yes. You know, I'm always, the more we can save, because right. that day's coming that everything's going to come tight again. And yeah. I just want to be able to see us just glide right through it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Oh, well, with that, do I have a motion to adjourn until 5 p.m. on April 10th, 2018 for the regular meeting? Motion. Moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Any opposed? <laughs> <laughs>